There we go. All right, I think we're officially live. Uh, welcome to everybody who's patiently waiting. Uh, I'm going to get the tweet up so that everybody else can come in that has also been patiently waiting. Uh, we got Broncos Bills tonight. Uh, two teams that nobody really knows what to do with, quite honestly. Uh, the Bills are... Uh, about as up and down as you could possibly get. And I put out a film room episode a few days ago trying to make sense of why the analytics behind the Bills suggest that they're maybe the best team in football, but why the scoreboard does not. And if you didn't get a chance to to watch that episode preceding this stream, the short version is uh, they are exceptionally good at digging themselves out of bad field position with hyper-aggressive pass plays down the field, especially to Stephon Diggs. They are uh, arguably the best offense in the entire league at digging themselves out of really shitty field position. And then they cross midfield, and kind of in between the 50 and the 30, things kind of fall apart, right? And, and they are... Uh, way too pass happy in that area of the field their run rate in that area of the field dropped down to if i recall correctly like 31 percent super low uh and and that was over the last five weeks when they started to to slide in the first four weeks they were about 50 50 they were much higher in terms of run pass balance in that specific area of the field they were able to finish a lot more drives and then for whatever reason last five weeks they got extraordinarily pass happy in that kind of 20 yard section so Uh, What I'm looking forward to tonight, first and foremost, is to see if the Bills stay balanced, uh, to see if they get a little bit more creative in the run game, introduce some shotgun power, a little bit more counter, um, or even if they're going to run inside zone and duo, if we could do it with some extra flair or creativity, something to to give these guys angles to run uh, run behind. Um, And then on the Broncos side of things, I'll be honest, got no idea what to make of uh, Russell Wilson and Sean Payton right now. Uh, And and on the defensive side of the ball, like there's been improvement since the first month of the season. I would say Vance Joseph has definitely made uh, a lot of adjustments in terms of, you know, they're kind of a base cover three team. But in terms of how they handle stuff over the middle of the field, there's been some adjustments there. So I'm really curious to see how they handle all the deep crossing routes from Buffalo, Uh, you know, if, if they don't. If they cannot get torn up by those the same way they did against Miami, that would be a major development. But I I don't really know what to make of Denver. I'm planning on doing a Broncos episode sometime in the future. Well, not even sometime in the future, like within a month from now, because I'm going out to Colorado in a few weeks. So I'm going to be doing a Broncos episode from Colorado to figure out what they are, (laughs) and you know, and and try to try to help Broncos fans understand their own team. Uh, but I, I feel pretty good about knowing what the Bills are. Uh, or rather, I feel pretty, go- pretty good about knowing what the Bills' problems are. And we'll see if they can get those fixed tonight. Um, as you can see, I do have an underdog entry on the screen right now. For those of you that are here that want to make this game slightly more interesting or at least semi-entertaining. I was trying to build this entry around... Um, you can call it hopium or copium uh, of Latavius Murray getting a little bit more run here with a lot of the, the duo and inside zone. So I got him at higher than 17 and a half rushing and then definitely a lot of hopium with them continuing to feature Dalton Kincaid. And I, I was trying to stack as many boosters on top of each other as I could because uh, Kincaid touchdown as a booster tonight. Uh, Tyler Bass getting more than one and a half field goals is a long shot for them statistically. They only have six field goal attempts in the last five games combined. But hey, if we get higher than one and a half field goals, that's a booster. And then Von Miller, if he can work against uh, a, a very vulnerable right tackle spot for the Broncos tonight and get a sack, that's a booster. And then Jaleel McLaughlin, who's a very underrated player who's been coming along for Denver this year, getting uh, over, over one and a half catches for them. If I stack all these boosters together, it's only a ten dollar entry, right? Like I don't, I don't do big money entries on Underdog, but stacking all of these boosters together, the payout is literally like six hundred eighty dollars. <laughs> so I was just trying to find as many boosters as I possibly could to put onto one entry, and I'll grab the link for that real quick if you guys feel like uh, tailing this whatsoever. Um, also, by the way, if you're new to Underdog and use promo code bootleg uh, at the link in the description below. They will match your deposit up to $100. And for new people, I don't have access to it because I don't have a new account. But for new signups, there's a special for tonight's game, which is Josh Allen 
um, at half of a passing yard, which theoretically would be automatic. But <laughs> twice before uh, this year, you know, you had Aaron Rodgers at like half a passing yard. He tore his Achilles and we had George Pickens a couple weeks ago at half a receiving yard and he got negative. So you would think it's automatic, but apparently not. But either way, if you feel like Josh Allen is going to get at least half of a passing yard tonight, uh, I'll throw that link in chat right now. You guys can either tail this slip or if you're new, add in the Allen to it. And uh, hopefully we can make this game a little bit interesting with that. Opening up to questions, uh, we already have a couple super chats that I want to get before uh, kickoff here. Uh, Riley for $10. Thank you, Riley. How about them Mercer Bears, Brett? Sounds to, <laughs> sounds to me like the Bills need Ty James or Devron Harper. Please, God, I don't need that to happen. Uh, so Riley Riley's our, our resident uh, uh, Mercer football uh, fiend, obviously works in the program. And uh, they just, they beat Samford, you know, the, the big, bad, evil empire uh, of the SCS, uh, FCS, Samford, and all but secured Mercer's position as a playoff team. So congratulations to Riley and everybody else in the Mercer program. Uh, also probably going to get their first player as a program drafted this year ever. Uh, now, there's debate about whether or not it's going to be Ty James or Devron Harper, who are their two excellent receivers. Uh, for me, I have Ty a little bit higher, but I know there are people um, within the scouting community that are, are partial to Devron Harper. Harper. Either way, one of them's going to get drafted, probably, and that'll be the first Mercer Bear to get drafted in the NFL. So big moment for that program. Congratulations, everybody out there uh, who made that happen. Sean Tron for $20. Uh, are coaches over relying on analytics for the answer, not a answer? Dallas two kicks away from beating the Eagles in the fourth comes to mind despite their own red zone efficiency screaming ignore the analytics and go for it on fourth down um I think in the end analytics is really all about probability and so you're playing probabilities right and I think in football where a there's only 17 regular season games and b in terms of you know fourth down opportunities in the red zone there might only be one or two of those in a game, right? And and you might go weeks without having a, a fourth and short opportunity in the red zone to even test the probabilities, right? And so we're working with with relatively small sample sizes uh, a lot of the time, or smaller sample sizes than you'll get in other sports like baseball, where there's a billion games, or hockey or basketball, right? Like analytics are a little bit more accurate in other sports that have more games, more plays, more opportunities uh, to, to put data down, right? And so you're working off probability um, and you might only get one or two opportunities over the course of a month to play those probabilities. And even within those singular opportunities, there's just so many factors, right? That can work either for or against you. You know, there's 22 guys in the field that all have different jobs to do and those jobs can change in an instant based on formation versus you know based on motion uh based on uh, uh f distribution in terms of how many receivers you have on one side versus the other you know are we hash uh, are we middle of the field um you know there's just there's so many different things that can change post snap from what you're getting pre-snap not to mention like you know some guy might have just got fucking kicked in the knee the play before and a block that he could normally pull off maybe he's struggling with because his knee really hurts and he's swelling up like a fucking watermelon you know like that can affect things where it's like hey if he, if he was him himself uh you know maybe he could he could hold a block that otherwise he couldn't in this one instance and then the play failed and you're like ah well shouldn't have gone for it it's like well you know, there's there's just an incredible amount of factors on these one singular opportunities for 22 guys in the field. And so I feel like a lot of people look at results and and not process. And that's what's really important when it comes to analytics is when you're dealing with probabilities, not certainties, it's about trusting process and the results are what they are because you acknowledge innately that there's so many factors that can make these decisions work or not work. Uh, but really all that matters is that is that your process is good and that you're trusting the numbers and you are trusting that over time your probabilities will work in your favor. Um, 
Now again, <laughs> doesn't always work that way because there's some there's some teams that go for it constantly, but they don't have good play calls in those situations. Uh, like I would say uh, Lombardi, when he was the offensive coordinator of the Chargers, they would go for it constantly, constantly, but Lombardi would dial up really stupid plays in those situations. So like the probabilities... <laughs> the probabilities were what they were, but like the math can't take into account like, hey, we have a really bad offensive coordinator. So like there's there's those situations, but generally you just want to trust the process and let the chips fall where, where they may. And that's, uh, I know it's it's a hard thing for a lot of coaches to stomach, but that's math for you. Uh, TJ Wave for five dollars. Brett, what is your opinion uh, with what Denver should do moving forward since they didn't trade anybody and still have Russ under contract? I still think Denver, just like me, like I'm still trying to figure out what Denver is. I think Denver's still trying to figure out what Denver is. You know, they got rid of their their older edges because they wanted, and then they had some young guys that they really like um, that they wanted to get more run. You know, I know they like Cooper, I know they like Benito, but they wanted to see what they have with those guys, right? Because you know, they're going into a draft where they might have an opportunity to look at a guy like Leao Latu. They might have an opportunity to look at like a Dallas Turner, uh, Chop Robinson. Like there's a bunch of really good edges that are going to go pretty early in this draft, but they're not going to know if they should take them until they figure out what they got in Cooper and Benito. So they're still trying to evaluate what they've got. They're trying to evaluate every DB they've got, not named Patrick Sertan. Like they know he's a stud, but they got to figure out who else can play. Um, they're, they're evaluating Russ. They're trying to figure out if if they need, like, if, if everything goes to hell, they're trying to figure out, like, hey, should we be in the Bo Nix run here? Like, should we be looking at um, Jaden Daniels from LSU? Like, this entire year is about evaluation. Once it became clear that they were not going to be one of the top teams in the AFC, it became about evaluation. And, you know, Sean Payton... Um, his contract, I don't want to say it makes him unfireable because the, the owners have more money than God. They can fire whoever they want and not care. But the implica- yeah, the implication is that Peyton is going to have time to build this thing. And part of building this thing is figuring out from the leftover regime who can play and who can't. So, you know, games like tonight, again, Denver knows what they are. And that's not like a top AFC team. Games like tonight are really about figuring out like what do we have for the future what can we count on for the future and that's important it's it's, it's important for figuring out how you approach the offseason uh job breakers for five dollars uh hey brett guess who started taylor heineke in fantasy my very own curse lives on i'm sorry for subjecting everyone to desmond ritter <laughs> oh god <laughs> yeah i still got to get to that game i want to see um i want to see how the cardinals looked in that game, uh, which if there's one thing I want to say about about the Cardinals and how they perform this year, it's that they really fight. Like, they fight so hard. Um, and, you know, going into the year, we were kind of looking at, you know, the clips of, of Jonathan Gannon and, you know, the who's riding the bus and all that kind of stuff. And people were clowning on Gannon because it just seemed awkward. And I agree it seemed awkward, but clearly the vibe in the room – of the guys that were actually hearing that speech bought in because every single week, this Cardinals team has fought their ass off for Jonathan Gannon. And I want to give him credit for that. Like they're not a very talented team overall, but they play really, really hard. And now that they got Kyler back, you know, obviously you beat Atlanta. Um, I want to, I want to go back and I want to watch a lot of the young pieces that the Cardinals have uh, and figure out and figure out for myself where they're going to go this off season because they have Houston's pick. They have their own pick. I mean, Houston's pick is going to be low, right? That's going to be in the twenties, but they have their own pick. Um, They have theoretically a franchise quarterback uh, like Kyler. If they're not in the top three picks and looking to, to take either may or Caleb. And if they're picking like say seven, you know, somewhere in that range, six or seven, um, I really want to get a good understanding of, of what the Cardinals are right now so I can figure out exactly how to mock for them because they can go in any direction, right? Um, and they're they're really one of the more fascinating teams to me for that reason is because they can go in any direction. But uh, yeah, as for the Falcons, the other side of that game, woof. Um, Arthur Smith, Desmond Ritter. I think uh, I think we're looking at a a new era in 2024 
without either of them, probably. <laughs> if we're being honest. <laughs> we're being completely honest about it. And I know I know Smith is pissed because like the one see how many touches do they give Bijan? It was probably a lot, right? I, it seemed like every time I was glancing at that game, Bijan was getting the ball. Uh, let's see. So Bijan had 22 carries and another catch. So 24 touches. And they lost. So I just know Arthur Smith is fucking incredulous because he's like, see, that's why I don't give Bijan Robinson touches. Oh, that whole team pisses me off. Anyway. Uh, let's see. Shrek the new for $5. Brett, I gotta be honest. I didn't believe you after year one, but you were right. Boy, a mafia is the goat linebacker. I'm sorry to keep doubting your draft analysis. Uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Uh, I mean, I love Mafe. Like I, I, that was a big one for me. Like, I, I did love him as a prospect, but, um, who you really should not doubt is, is Clint Hurt, but in particular, BT Jordan who's the pass rush coach they brought in. Uh, BT Jordan made that pick work. Like, if you look at Mafe this year versus Mafe uh, at the start of his career, they're entirely different players, and it's because of BT Jordan. He is so good at what he does. So I loved Mafe as a talent. I also recognized he had a while to go, uh, and and BT got – he BT, like, weaponized that talent that was there. So uh, I will claim half credit because I got lucky that the Seahawks hired Coach Jordan. That's for sure. But he has a sack in seven straight games which I think is the longest streak in the NFL right now for, for sacks or games with a sack. Uh, Hendog for $10. How you doing, Hendog? Good to see you again. Uh, do the Bills really need to start looking at a rebuild of the offensive line a la Chiefs after the Tampa Super Bowl? I don't know about rebuild. Like, I don't, th- I don't think the Bills offensive line is that bad. Um, what annoys me, like, if you're if you're just looking at like raw pass protection metrics. I'm talking, you know, non RPO, non play action. Like they're fine there generally. And if you're looking at um, run blocking, like true run blocking, I'm not talking about super wide splits. Everybody's in a two point stance. You're asking them to dig out a three technique while standing. Like it, they're not put into positions to succeed in a lot of their runs. But if you're looking at like true run blocking reps, hands in the dirt, we're under center, like go blast that dude. Like, they're actually pretty good. Like they're they're actually a legitimate, uh, legitimately fine, or more at run blocking. It's just the nature of the offense. Again, all this two point stance stuff. Like you're never gonna get a leverage advantage when you're run blocking from a two point stance. Let alone when everybody's splits are super wide, so the double teams just don't really have any power behind them. Um, like you're you're never gonna have an advantage run blocking in this system the way that it's currently constructed. So I don't I don't necessarily hold that against a lot of the Bills offensive line. Do they need depth? Yes, absolutely. Uh, could they, especially at tackle, you know, could they look at adding um, a swing tackle that could develop into a starter semi-early in the draft? Yeah, but like, I don't necessarily think it's, you know, sound the alarm. We need to absolutely get one. Um, Honestly, if I'm if I'm trying to sound the alarm about anything Bills related, uh, I I don't, I don't know if receiver is even that big of a deal. Like I think Gabe is okay. I think Shakir's been good in spots. Dalton Kincaid's eventually going to be essentially the wide receiver too. And then you got Stephon. You know, as Stephon gets older, I would say okay, that's a reason to look at receiver because he's got to be thirty by now, right? What is Stephon Diggs now? He's 29, so he turns 30 in a, in a few weeks. So you will look at receiver early to groom as the new number one down the line, but I don't necessarily think that like they don't have anybody beyond Stephon Diggs. Um, honestly, the, the Bills' main problem is just play calling in key spots. Like they... They have the tools to run the ball. They have the tools to be balanced. They're just not doing it. So I would say, if anything, Dorsey's Dorsey's a little bit more to blame than just pure talent here. Uh, 10, 10, 10 Guile, 10 Gile for five dollars. Always enjoy the vids. Random question: Do smaller schools quarterbacks? Do smaller school quarterbacks have a higher NFL potential ceiling than big school quarterbacks? Lately, seems so. I don't know about ceiling. Um, 
I will say what's what a lot of smaller school quarterbacks have going for them is that they're not playing with elite talent around them, right? And so they're getting more reps being under serious pressure. They're getting more reps where they have to throw guys open because they're not just naturally getting open all the time. Uh, you know, that's why so many people have held uh, ha- have held that against Alabama quarterbacks, rightly or wrongly, right? Uh, so many people have held it against Oklahoma quarterbacks and, and Ohio State quarterbacks. And, and that's why a lot of people have seen, like, C.J. Stroud as the outlier, right? Where, uh, you know, you're looking at a lot of other Ohio State quarterbacks that were playing behind elite offensive lines with elite weapons, and they, they never had any sort of adversity. You know, C.J. Stroud was, was seen as, like, the first Ohio State quarterback that dealt with adversity, like in the Georgia game, and, and obviously did did really well. Um, whereas smaller school guys, like Josh Allen, when he was at Wyoming, it's adversity every week, man. Like, especially when they're playing FBS schools, just getting fucking shelled behind that offensive line, throwing to nobody that was going to be in the NFL. Um, and so I, I just think the, the getting reps, getting quality reps with – unquality circumstances is very important for a young quarterback. And for some of them from big schools that come in the NFL, the first quality reps they ever get with live bullets where everything is not going according to plan all the time is literally in the NFL. And that, that can be tough to tough to adjust to. We're seeing what happens with Bryce young, right? It's tough to adjust to. Um, Not that Bryce young had like, the best Alabama team around him in his last year, but but still, point remains. So, uh, again, I don't know about saying high, higher ceiling, but I do think that a lot of them are just more used to adversity than the bigger school guys, and that unironically helps them out. Uh, Nicholas Cox, would you consider making a video on Witherspoon? I'm assuming you're talking about uh, Devin Witherspoon from the Seahawks. And, yes, I would love to because I specifically want to compare him to Rondé Barber and the NFL, we love the NFL, uh, if they're watching this, thank you. Uh, the NFL so graciously gave me some early 2000s Bucks All-22, so I can directly compare prime Rondé All-22 to young Devin Witherspoon All-22 and talk about you know what makes a good nickel, why is Witherspoon so good in that role, what are the, the Rondé Barber type traits that he has, and I can use Rondé All-22 and... And, uh, and do something with that. Uh, I have no idea when that's going to be, <laughs> truth be told. I have a bunch of other stuff on the docket right now. I'm doing a, a Marvin Harrison Jr. versus Jamar Chase video in terms of like who's the best prospect, uh, just because that's an interesting debate that I find fascinating. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? Um, oh, I'm doing a video on, it's not really a film study video, but it is a gift guide for football fans, and that's going to be coming out late November. At least I'm planning on it coming out late in November of like, uh, if you have just a hardcore degenerate football fan in your life, what do you get him for Christmas? I have, I have a couple ideas for that. Uh, and then obviously the Broncos episode that I'm recording in early December. And then I might, might do a Ravens defense video during their bye week in week 13. I'm definitely gonna be doing a Lions video coming up soon. There's a couple other, I, I, a couple others that I had. Uh, in mind that I can't quite remember at the moment, but you know, rest of the regular season is uh, pretty book solid. So maybe I'll have to do the Witherspoon video either in January or after the season. Oh, and then I have some wild plans for draft season too. So it might be a bit <laughs> uh, storm for ten dollars. Let's all celebrate the fact that we get to watch Kyler play again. So much fun to watch. Uh, again, I still got to go through and watch all the all twenty two from him, but from what my film friends were saying Kyler looks like 85% of the way back, which is still better than a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL and probably most quarterbacks in the NFC. So we'll see if, uh, if the Cardinals kind of put something together in the back half of the year. Again, I I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. I think they're in too deep of a hole right now, but really what's, what's crucial for the Cardinals organization going forward is establishing that winning culture, kind of like what Dan Campbell did in the back half of last year when they started out with a very similar record. Like they started out, what, like two and six, something like that. 
and but they ripped off some wins in the back half. They established the fact that they could win football games, and they came back this year and, and looked great. Like that's kind of what the Cardinals are trying to do here: establish that they can win football games with Kyler. Fuck them picks. Like you know they're 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 not trying to to finish in the top three clearly, or else they wouldn't have brought Kyler back. Um, but they want to establish a winning culture and and take all the assets they have and, and roll into 2024. And I. I think that's a pretty good plan, ultimately. Uh, Robert Estes for $10. Hey, Brett, I'm wondering why Baltimore seems to always choke winnable games. 20 games lost when up two scores since 2013. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, whew, that is a lot. Uh, love Harbs, but he seems to be getting stale, similar to how Reed got stale in Philly. Um, I think winning NFL games is hard, uh, especially when you go up super early and even though players players say uh, we don't take our foot off the gas like when you're dominating somebody like it can be hard to sometimes like keep your focus in the game like if you're just completely manhandling it, it can be hard to keep that focus um, and un- <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately for the Ravens they manhandle a lot of teams and uh, sometimes I feel like they can hit cruise control a little bit too early. And then all of a sudden, you know, Lamar's chucking up a pick on a ball that he absolutely should not. And then, then you get a pick six after that. And then all of a sudden it comes down to, oh, like we have to tackle Deshaun in space to keep them from getting into field goal range. Oh shit, we missed the tackle, right? And then we lose. So I, I think that losing focus when you are a dominant team can sometimes – be an issue and it's definitely been an issue for Baltimore the one thing that John Harbaugh has to improve with this team is not taking their foot off the gas like absolutely not taking their foot off the gas not going cruise control like when you're up get up by more they did that against Detroit and Detroit's a very good team now like they did it they did that against Detroit they got up and they didn't relent. They just kept going and going and going and just blew the doors off. Like they have to do that to everybody. They cannot, especially in the in, in division game, they cannot take their foot off the gas like that. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if Harbaugh's stale, but that is an issue for sure. Uh, po- potato for 150. Thank you. Uh, anyone has any booze? I ran out watching the Giants. Need more for the rest of the season. Yeah, I didn't actually watch the Giants-Cowboys game because I was like, mm, Tommy DeVito against Micah Parsons. That's probably <laughs> it's probably going to be the last one that I get to this week. And it will be. It'll be the last game that I get to. I'll probably watch it on like Wednesday because we knew going into it what that one was going to be. And it seems like we were all correct about that. Uh, I saw a stat that the Cowboys outgained the Giants by more yardage than any team has been outgained by in 44 years. Good God. (laughs) There's one thing the Cowboys are really good at. It's absolutely shitting on bad teams. Anthony Vitale for $2. Uh, Can we get a video on the Jets offense? Oh my God, why? You masochist. (laughs) Like... Was was the Patriots episode not enough for you? You want more punishment? I, I I've done I've done Patriots, I've done Steelers. Like, are we just gonna roll through every single shitty offense this year <laughs> and do a video on it? Uh, Jared Rose for five dollars. Hi Brett, love all your work. How would you value Jalen Warren versus David Montgomery in PPR Dynasty? Ooh, I have a chance to get Warren in a one-one swap. Ooh, that's a good question. Let me see. Hold on. What's Jalen? Warren's contract because we know Montgomery is at least going to be in Detroit next year let me see what Warren's deal is so he's signed through 2024 okay so he'll he'll at least be in Pittsburgh and we know that he's got more juice than Najee not that Najee's like a terrible player but Warren definitely has more juice I guess the question comes down to, do you believe that Jameer Gibbs will eventually out-touch David Montgomery in uh, in low red zone opportunities? Throughout the entire year, David Montgomery has been the low red zone guy in Detroit. This past week, 
Uh, now, whether or not it was because he was coming off injury, who knows? We'll have to keep track of this. Uh, within the past or this past week, uh, Jameer Gibbs out touched Montgomery inside the 10, four to two. Does that mean anything? No idea. Uh, I would lean towards no, because I believe they brought in Montgomery specifically to be that guy. And I would say the more likely scenario is that Gibbs did it just because Montgomery is injured. Um, or at least coming off injury, and they didn't want to get him banged up again. Like, they're trying to do a playoff run here. Like, I get it. Um, so, I would still think even next year Montgomery is going to be the red zone guy, but it depends on what you believe, right? If you think that Jameer Gibbs is going to take that role in addition to all the stuff he does in between, in between the 20s, then, yeah, you would side with Warren on that deal. If you think that Montgomery, no matter what, is going to be the one vulturing touchdowns, I would side Montgomery on that deal. That's how I look at it, at least. Uh, all right, Bill's getting ready to kick off here. Oh, no, Broncos kicking off two Bills. That's what it is. All right, so we get to see the Bills offense first things first. Uh, what is your favorite soccer team? I don't think I have one. And I say that as somebody who used to cut LA Galaxy highlights every single week. I still never even really... I mean, I enjoyed watching MLS. Um, but then when I would cut like Premier League highlights back when I worked in TV and I would see the difference between Premier League and MLS, I was like, oh shit, they're playing like a totally different sport over there. <laughs> like, It's not even close. <laughs> I was like, we fucking suck at soccer. Damn. <laughs> like England's way better than us. Wow. All right, Josh came out throwing. Uh, they ran a four-strong look. Uh, oh, did we fumble? First play? Oh, my God. All right. I'm not going to say Coleman curse yet, but we might be flirting with that, folks. <laughs> oh, man. First play, and they fumble. But was he down? I don't know. Look at the knee, right knee specifically. Nope, he wasn't down. That's a fumble. Good God, Buffalo. Come on now. All right, well, with that said, I'm going to pour my first whiskey of the night. Oh, that's right. I forgot these fucking mason jars are just hell to open. There we go. So the one thing about 13 Monkeys is the fact that the whiskey's in a mason jar. So you get something with sugar in it, like whiskey, and it just fucking freezes it closed. All right. Cheers. Oh, it's so good, too. It's so good. All right. Broncos starting from just outside Bill's red zone. Start off with an inside zone. Here's, here's my thing. In a sudden change situation, I would consider this four down territory if my fourth down is anything five yards or under. Right? Because you, you just stole a possession. And if we, if we don't get it, fine, whatever. Like they're, they're starting back in the exact same spot. But I would almost consider this four down territory because I want to get seven here and really quiet the crowd. If you only give up, or if you only get three, you know, the defense basically considers that a win. If they're starting on like the 30, right? So I want to get seven here. I might consider four down. So what are we, third and seven? Let me pull up my coverage data here. Now, this is typically for the Bills going to be a quarters heavy spot in a third and seven, but in this area of the field, see, they are presenting quarters. Oh, we got a flag. Oh, that's rough. Bill's defense was having some communication issues before that, and McGlinchey jumped. Ooh. All right, so third and very long. Typically, let's see, what are the Bills heavy in? Ooh, a lot of cover two in these instances. Not many of them, because it's not often you get like a third and 12. But 
A lot of cover two. So we'll see if they give that to us. They're kind of presenting it. Looking like cover two here. Oh, they just ran. Ooh, they got a pretty decent chunk, though. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be fourth and four, fourth and five. Do they go for it? <sighs> Cowards. They're going to kick the field goal. I would have legitimately considered going for it there. Try to get seven. Oh, well. Uh, thoughts on Secret Base's series on the Vikings. They didn't mention Jared Allen, which was kind of sad. I still haven't got to watch it yet. I've heard very good things about it, though. Everything Secret Base does is amazing. Like, their whole team there is awesome. So I'm sure it's incredible. I just haven't found uh, enough hours to carve out to watch that yet. Uh, what do you think the inefficiency with Cooper Cup and Josh Jacobs is? This season, I love both players and tend not to blame them. To me, it seems like a mix of poor coaching and poor QB play is at fault. Um, I mean, with Cooper Cup, I haven't I haven't watched the Rams offense in a couple weeks, but with Cooper Cup, the last time I was there, I was at SoFi in the Steelers game, and like he just had a lot of uncharacteristic drops. Like with, within the first series or two of the game, he had two drops. Um, so that was kind of weird. I still got to watch uh, over the last couple games since he's come back, how he's looked. But, um, yeah, that was, that was kind of uncharacteristic for him. And then Josh Jacobs, I mean, they've got him going over the last couple weeks since McDaniels left. So I would say there might be a pre-McDaniels and post-McDaniels split there for, for Josh Jacobs' usage and efficiency. Um, I agree, though, two of my favorite players as well. Mike McFlinchy. <laughs> Fun fact, Mike McGlinchey, uh, cousin of Matt Ryan, believe it or not. Yes, I was also shocked when I heard they're related, but they are. Uh, who's your comparison for Brock Bowers? Ooh. That's a good one. You know, he's he's kind of got some, like, Vernon Davis to him. You know, I don't know if he's going to run 4-4. Like, I mean, he's going to run fast. He's going to run really fast. I don't know if he's going to run, like, that fast. But I would say in terms of skill set, he reminds me a lot of Vernon Davis. In terms of catch and run ability, uh, mid-career Vernon Davis effort as a blocker, like early career Vernon, early career Vernon Davis didn't block at all but um after after a few years in the league he really started taking pride in blocking he was very very good at it um i know some people have thrown out like delaney like bigger delaney walker uh i think he's faster than delaney i think he's better after the catch than delaney but i i get it like i totally get it um so somewhere in between those two 49er tight ends i would say uh is a is a pretty decent comp Uh, do we have Josh arm punt shots for tonight? Oh, <laughs> you're playing with fire. Uh, I don't know if I could do shots tonight, especially when we got the Thursday stream for uh, for Bengals Ravens coming up on bootleg later this week. And I EJ mentioned something on the pod today, which that the week 10 recap pod uh, podcast is going to be out on the bootleg channel tomorrow morning. Uh, but he mentioned that there were some Bengals fans on Thursday that wanted us to do a Bengal bomb, which is apparently Jaeger in Orange Fanta, which probably isn't great, but it's probably also better than Malort, so it's an upgrade for me. But it doesn't sound appetizing, <laughs> so I'm trying to limit my shots that I take this week. Oh, fucking A, Josh. No way. Did he get his feet in? That's why we don't do shots for Josh arm punts, by the way, because that happens. Oh, I don't think he got his foot in. I think it's incomplete. Ooh. He's trying to get picked, though. 
Good God, Josh. I, I could tell he wanted to leave that outside and just left it too far inside. And still going down the field. That looks like a miscommunication. Kind of looked like DB was playing it top down. And Josh thought that he was going to keep taking it outside and the receiver snapped it off. Uh, that was the same general uh, thing that happened when they got called against Cincy for uh, the intentional grounding, right? The Bills have a lot of side adjusts built into their offense with their outside receivers. Like if DB's playing top down, they'll, they'll snap it off. But you still got to be on the same page, right? Because sometimes Josh thinks they're going to keep going and then they don't. All right, so it'll be a three and out for Buffalo. So we start with a turnover and a three and out. Uh, as good a start as you could possibly hope for the Broncos defense. Oh wait, no, now it's through now it's third down. Why was the last was there a penalty that I wasn't aware of that made the last play first down? There must have been. Okay, I must have missed a penalty. Either way, Josh just converted. Look like a deep curl against quarters there. Oh, it was a holding. Okay, that makes sense. Missed that. Yeah, so you can see... On that play, DB was playing top down, and Gabe just snapped it off. Like, the Bills do that constantly, you know? They, they basically, they, they bet on you playing over the top of them over and over again and getting tired of the endless curls and comebacks uh, on these side adjusts until you start playing low shoulder on them, and that's when they hit you with the deep ball, right? It's not really lulling into a false sense of security. It's just annoying you into playing low shoulder technique. And then they kill you. Oh, are we going to hit our Latavius Murray over? I think we just did on one play. Hold on. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Let's go. All right, one down. Again, we got we got six hundred dollars at stake here, guys. I only put in ten, but if all these hit, I win six hundred or six eighty three to be exact. Look at that boost. Three three point four X. Oh my god. I'm the worst. So best best possible outcome for this drive is also getting a Dalton Kincaid touchdown, and then we're we're good to go. And then I think we're actually going to hit it. I wonder if McDermott's going to bench Cook after that fumble. Probably not. Probably not. I mean, objectively speaking, he's got more juice than Latavius. How much did you bet? It was only ten dollars. That's the thing. Like on underdog, when you're stacking a bunch of, uh, when you're stacking a bunch of boosts together on underdog, and these are all very reasonable numbers. You know, Von Miller getting a sack, Latavius getting 17 and a half rushing yards, Kincaid getting a touchdown, Bass getting a couple field goals. But if you stack them all together, it boosts everything by crazy. So the payout is 68.35x. So a ten dollar entry is. Potentially getting me a nice steak dinner if we if we hit on this. We'll see. We'll see. All right, second and 13 here. Bill's off schedule, but against quarters, they have a million answers for that. All right, Kincaid to the flat. That's going to bring up third and long. 
typically for this Broncos defense in between the 20s, in between, let's see, what is it, third and third and seven? Oh, third and four. They actually got a lot more than I thought. All right, so third and medium. Denver is whoo, 42% cover one. All right, so expect man coverage here in a third and medium. Typical answer for man is going to be mesh, but they are presenting double mug, so I doubt this is man. They're probably going to back out, and they do. Oh, oh, God. Jesus. Chat, I... It's... Remember how we said the Bills love turning the ball over before they can kick field goals? <laughs> there you go. I mean... Clearly, they didn't watch the episode. <laughs> My lord. Okay. It's, it's, it's such a typical Bills game. And that's what's really, really annoying is that this is a typical Bills game. That's insane. That is... Wow. And for all these Buffalonians, like I, I, was, I was getting you know messages from my buddies that were at the tailgate at... God, it was like 10 a.m. my time this morning. So they were there at 1. They all took the day off work. You know, they're going out to the stadium. Like, that's the kind of town Buffalo is. It's November. It's a Monday night game in Buffalo. We're taking the day off work. We're going to go make some ribs in the parking lot and then go to the game. You take your day off work for this. Come on now. Like, that stadium's got to be crickets at this point. You got two turnovers, one potential other turnover they got lucky on thinking here we go again good god justin ziegler for five dollars could you do a video on how michigan shut down penn state's offense and how they successfully ran the ball against psu's defense last weekend that is interesting actually um i could potentially in draft season roll that into like a blake quorum video because i know i'm going to be talking a lot about quorum i don't know <laughs> What, how much I'm going to be talking about J.J. McCarthy because it feels like they just don't want him to throw the ball. <laughs> Not that he can't throw the ball, but it, like eight attempts the entire game. So the J.J. McCarthy scouting report is going to be hard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the price of being on a great team, I guess. But I would like to see, you know, honestly, that's what we need. We need J.J. McCarthy to have a similar type of game to what uh, C.J. Stroud had against Georgia where things aren't going right. And and for once, for him, things need to not go right. There needs to be a lot of pressure. You know, there needs to be, um, there, there needs to be like receivers struggling to get open. Like, let's see how he handles that. Because so far, Michigan's just rolled everybody they played. And it's really, really hard to do an evaluation like that. Uh, Kel for $5. When I walked into the stadium, I didn't expect to be pleased ish that we only gave up a field goal on our first offensive drive. How you feeling now, Kel? <laughs> Not to twist the knife, but how are you feeling now? Oh man. All right. Ooh, nice catch. Who was that? Is that Hamler? KJ Hamler? Is that got that? Also, that pick is not on Josh. They're showing the replay like it hit Gabe Davis in the hands. Oh, Humphrey, not Hamler. Lil Jordan. Top tier name, by the way. Easily all name team. All right, Hamler's one. All right, he wasn't 17. I think Hamler's one. They were too busy using Penn State like the Rage Room to vent their frustrations with the Harbaugh suspension. <laughs> All right. Bills are a pretty heavy cover two team. 
on early downs. They're kind of showing it here, but under center, they might want to rotate down. Yeah, it looks like they did. So that'll bring up third and was it third and medium. Bills kind of play a little bit of everything in these down and distances. Most common would be cover one and cover two. Uh, let's see if it's third and four. Probably going to get man coverage here. Probably like a one cross. So you protect in the middle of the field. Ooh. All right. There's our first Jaleel McLaughlin reception. And he's got juice. Like they, I, I don't, I don't know where they found this kid, but he's, he's really, really fun to watch. He's like my new, oh no, that, that was Javonta. Wrong number. My bad. Wrong number. <laughs> I thought that was Jaleel McLaughlin. <laughs> Either way, great catch by Javonta. False start on the fullback. Uh, Buffalo was turned into absolute garbage. No mental toughness or situational awareness. Party is over. Mafia. I don't know. I don't know if I'd say party's over. Their situational awareness is not great, though. I will give you that one. I will give you that one. <laughs> what was the net EPA of that drive? Probably plus four. <laughs> you might be right, honestly. Ooh, got a little bit of end around here. Brought it down for a loss. So it's going to be what? Second and second and 20. Yikes. That's not great. Whoa, are they calling that a fumble? Hold on. Stand by. They're celebrating, but there's nothing on the scoreboard. Oh, shit, they did call it a touchdown. What? Hold on. Elbow, wrist. So he's on top. So I know they don't consider forearm. Do they consider elbow as being down? I thought they did. Like, I think it's like anything here or out to here, they consider live. But once you get to the elbow, you're down. Yeah, it looks like they call them down. Okay. All right, well, either way, uh, second and very long. Uh, bills are pretty heavy on uh, on cover two, and they're presenting... Oh, no, they're rolling down to cover three. Cool. And on third and forever, not a whole lot of answers here. I'm going to guess... Either we get another kind of give up run if they get the look for it, meaning if both interior linemen are like four eyes or wider, they might just call a run into that. Uh, but if they're getting a traditional front, maybe hit them like a quick pass or something. So it's traditional front. We're going empty, double chips. Oh, God. And incomplete. All right. Well, good series for Buffalo to limit the damage. It's as good a, good a result as they can hope for after another pick. <laughs> Kel says, Jesus Christ. It's a good thing they sell alcohol here. <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. I'm sure the little bats are already flowing in that stadium.
Uh, Mike's dad for five dollars. Thoughts on Secret Breeze? Oh, I already wrenched it. I already did that one. Uh, I think I did a lot of them. Uh, Curtis Rogers for two dollars. Who are your top five run blocking, run blocking running backs? So we're talking about like fullbacks, or are we talking like when we're in a two back set with like, you know, back when they did Zeke Elliott and Pollard, and Zeke would block for Pollard. Because uh, if so, Zeke's on that list. Um, I would also say AJ Dillon when they would do all the two back stuff with Aaron Jones. He was pretty good at that, being lead blocker. Um, God, who else? Taysom Hill, unironically, right? Does that count? We can, we can call him a fullback. Fine. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what other teams do, like the the two back stuff. Like not with a fullback though, but with two actual running backs. Oh, um, Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert's really good at it. And Texans have done it a little bit with Damian Pierce in the past. I, I, again, just going off top of the dome, <laughs> running backs that can block for other running backs that aren't fullbacks. All right. I think I got through all the super chats. And thank you for everybody who did give a super chat, by the way. Appreciate it. Uh, would use check count? I mean, it, I again, I'm, as a fullback, yeah. But I'm trying to remember like running backs who are running backs who do it. Uh, Gus Edwards. Oh yeah, Gus. Gus. Gus can do it for sure. Um, Gus did it for uh, J.K. Dobbins quite frequently. Bearden for five dollars uh, was at SHSU versus La Tech tonight. Uh, might be a coach wasting talent via play call, but Smoke Harris didn't look amazing. Seven catches, twenty-five yards, tape worth a watch, I think. So Smoke Harris is super fun. He's really fast. Uh, he, he's faster than you think he would be for his build. He is a, uh, he's a thick little dude. <laughs> that's, my, that's my scouting report. Thick little dude who runs fast. But uh, he's, he, he's, he's built like a brick shit house despite his height. He's got legitimate 4-4 speed. Very dangerous in the open field. His problem is in, he's in a very stacked receiver class with a lot of very fast dudes. And if given the choice between Smoke Harris and, say, uh, Corley from Western Kentucky to play similar roles as, like, the space threat, the yak guy, like, Corley to me is better. Uh, he, he, Corley's really, really good. Uh, Worthy, the kid from Texas, really, really good at that. So the thing working against Smoke Harris is that he's just in, like, the deepest receiver class I can remember in a long time. All right, Bill's getting back to running the ball a little bit. So Latavius is out there again. I wonder if they did bench Cook. We see him on the sidelines. His helmet's on. But I wonder if maybe they're they're punishing him a little bit for giving it away. All right, Broncos are a very heavy cover three defense. They look like they're in cover three with the five-man service here. Josh, again, looks like a water buffalo covered in hyenas. Or I guess lions is the more accurate thing. McD loves benching fumblers. Well, they've had quite a few this year, so he's gotten practice. Also, super interesting that they called... Um, it's like a power read behind Dawkins there, which I know some of you might be thinking wait a minute power is not when you pull a tackle it depends it depends uh when you see a, a pulling tackle actually this is a good opportunity to do our first whiteboard of the night because i got a little whiteboard just for these circumstances so i'm gonna draw this up real quick So 
So as we get here into third and nine, let's see if they convert. Ooh, Josh barely got it out and they stalled. All right, so whiteboard time. Hopefully you guys can see that. So power, a lot of the time, I would say most of the time, it's you're pulling a guard to the side where the three technique is, right? And you're gonna down block on this three technique uh, with both the guard and the tackle. Either you're gonna get a fullback or, or whoever to kind of kick out uh, this front side edge and then guards gonna pull through, right? Here's the problem. If you wanna run power the other way and you want this guard to be pulling and he's blocking down and he's doing the kick out, but if you want this guard where the three tech is lined up and you're trying to run power into the B gap bubble over here, it's tough because this three technique could very easily just chase the puller and just kind of shoot into that gap. And this tackle is supposed to post and then like he's supposed to post it here to kind of allow the center to back block on a three technique. But if you're, if you're playing against a really quick three technique, I, I don't I don't care who you got there at center or at tackle like they could very easily still split that and cause a lot of issues so there's an adjustment that some teams have let me do a little bit of a race here there's an adjustment that some teams have and the bills are one of these teams where when they run power out of the shotgun away from the three technique to try to get it into this bubble they just have an adjustment where this guy back blocks this guy back blocks, center works up to second level, um, and then they'll pull the tackle, which looks like a dart play because dart is like a name for basically power but with pulling a tackle, but it kind of depends. Like it, it's basically you turning power, you're turning power into dart as just a read based on where the three technique is, and it's just an adjustment that the Bills have. So anytime you see them pulling Deion Dawkins, it's because they called power away from the three technique and they just don't want to deal with doing a back block and they want to get the center up and then you pull Dawkins. And then if you have a tight end here, like he can kind of get in the way, or if you're just doing a read action on the backside uh, to kind of freeze this backside end. But like you see them pull Deion Dawkins um, quite a bit as a way to make their angles easier in the run game. It's one of the few things that I think they actually do very well in the run game in terms of like creativity and giving their guys you know, a chance to succeed. I wish that they would have similar creativity in their inside zone and duo game. They don't <laughs> like power is one of the few things that I think they're super fun at, um, which, which is what makes it so frustrating for me to evaluate Ken Dorsey. Cause I'm like, you do it for that. Why can't you do it for everything else? Anyway, hope, hope that made sense. Chat. Let me know if it didn't. But that's why we got the little whiteboard is so we can do kind of stuff like that during commercial breaks. Uh, Luke, for $5, you know the Bills offense is in trouble when even you can't reverse jinx them. Yikes, Brett, yikes. Hope you're well, brother. And I hope you're well, too, as well, Luke. Uh, by the way, what we're drinking tonight, I don't know if I mentioned it, 13 Monkeys. It's a local Buffalo whiskey, uh, veteran-owned and operated. I met them when I was tailgating in Buffalo last year. Great dudes that make very good whiskey for a very good cause. So if you happen to live in, I think they, I think they distribute all over Western New York, but if you happen to live in that area, look for 13 monkeys. It's good stuff. It tastes like peanuts, like very peanut forward. Ooh, Javonta, good run. Did you get my second super chat from Jawbreakers? I don't think I did. I think I might have missed that. Um, it won't let me scroll back up that far. Just let me know what it was. Don't donate again. I don't, I don't need any more money. <laughs> but uh, just let me know what it was and I'll answer it. Another good run from Javante moving the chains. Death himself for $2. Shout out to Jam Jamison Williams for that block on Sunday. Uh, he's referring to, uh, if you didn't see it, chat, the David Montgomery 75-yard uh, run, you could see JMO like accelerating super fast uh, past uh, David Montgomery to give himself an angle to block down the field. It was awesome. It was a great effort play.
All right, first and 10 here. Russ has been under center, I think, this entire drive. Ooh, here comes the shot. Rather, here comes the check down. <laughs> he must not have liked what he saw down the field. I don't know if they're going to give us a view of it, but that is something that's that they'll give credit for. If it's not there, check it down. Get whatever yards you can. They got six on that. Nice sweater, Brett. Uh, thank you. This is from Homage, which uh, I don't know how many people here listen to the podcast, but over on our podcast channel, the Bootleg Football Podcast, Homage is a clothing partner, and they have these for, for every single team, and they're very comfortable, and I love them a lot. And, uh, you know, I'm celebrating the Lions this week. I, I'm going to try to get these particular crew necks for as many teams as I can get. But uh, if you go to any podcast episode, there's like a link to homage in the description and anything that you guys spend on homage through that link, we get a cut of. So we appreciate all of you guys for doing that. All right. It'd be third and third and what? Third and four. I think we're going to get that on the other side of the quarter break. Bill's defense on third and four is... I don't want to say like super heavy in man coverage, but decently heavy in man coverage. So it's 25% cover one, 18 to 19% cover two, 15% cover three, 12, 12 and a half percent quarters, 12 and a half percent quarter, quarter, half. And this is just in third and medium situations. Uh, and then, wow, 9.4% zero. That's more than I expected. So when we get on the other side of the quarter break, uh, statistically speaking, most likely to see either a man coverage look uh, or potentially a cover two look if they're worried about uh, rubs. So we'll have to see if they come out in either a stack or a bunch or anything like that. If it's just straight up everybody spread out, I have to imagine we'll see man coverage. Um, but if they kind of want to zone it because they're worried about uh, like switch releases or anything like that, or, or rubs or like shallow crosses. I have to imagine we'll see cover two there. So those are the two most common calls at least. Or maybe they won't give a shit and they'll just call zero, but we'll see. Let's see. Jawbreaker says, something about using my curse and grabbing Dak so the Panthers will win a game and give the Giants the one and only Caleb Williams. <laughs> oh, so you're scheming. You're scheming. That's what your super chat was. I'll tell you what, Jawbreakers. Uh, if Tommy DeVito starts every remaining game for the Giants, you will not need help from the curse. Congratulations, Caleb Williams is a Giant. If Tommy DeVito starts the rest of the year, I don't think they win another game. Like it's, it's so bad. It's so bad. Like I, again, I didn't even watch the Cowboys game cause I, I knew how it was going to go. And I was right. They got the shit kicked out of them. <laughs> like if Tom DeVito's the start of the rest of the year, it is, it is directly as an effort to get Caleb Williams or Drake may. <laughs> like that's what it is. Uh, TJ for $5. Brett, where do you find all your advanced analytical data, like the percentage of coverages that the Bills run? So I pull that. Uh, so there's a there's a database that all the teams have access to and that the league ha has access to. And uh, because I make content for the league, they gave me access to it so that I could use it. And I don't... Don't know how much about that I'm allowed to say, <laughs> truth be told, but uh, they, they gave me access to it so that I could, uh, I could make content with it. And this is the content. Sort of. Kind of. All right. Russ on third and four. I actually didn't catch the cover that the Bills were in. But considering that there was a wide open rushing lane, I'm going to assume cover one because very rarely do you ever see that much space without cover one. Unless it was two man, maybe it was two man. Oh no, that was. What was that? It kind of looked like man outside, but with zone help in the middle and two high safeties. But the safeties weren't bracketing anybody, so it didn't look like quarters. What was that? 
I, mm, I'm going to have to go back and look at the all 22 on that one. I literally could not tell what that was. Like I was trying to look at the safety technique and the safeties were not bracketing anybody. So I don't know. JPP to the Saints, Zay Jones arrested for battery. Are, are these like headlines that just happened? Uh, Sharp? No, I don't, I don't get my data from Sharp. And I don't think the teams do either. At least the teams I know don't. All right, smartly getting it away from Russ. Uh, Brett, do you think Caleb has any decent chance of being a bust with his character issues and turnover problems when facing ranked defenses? I don't think Caleb has character issues. That's, I guess that's where I start with it. Like when I've talked to my friends around that program and in that program, all of them speak glowingly about Caleb in terms of work ethic, in terms of leadership. Like you will not hear a bad word from anybody about Caleb. Like when I was at the pro day back in March, um, you know, it was in the, it was on a rainy day on a, on the middle of class day. And, uh, and, and Caleb, like it was delayed by an hour and a half. Like we were, we were sitting out there just torrential downpour because the, the in indoor facility wasn't long enough to hold a 40 yard dash. So we were waiting through the rain and Caleb's out there like waiting the entire time to, to support his guys going through the pro day, like just super chill. Like, you know, wasn't, wasn't there to like make a big scene or anything. Like he just kind of sat off to the side and supported his guys, went over, talked to him, hyped him up, everything like that. Like, I don't know. That locker room loves Caleb Williams. I don't see any character issues whatsoever. At least from the people that I've talked to within that program, they love that kid. So, like, you know, talking about like painting nails or something. Like, I, I truthfully, I I don't care about that about the painting nails thing. I don't care that he cried in his mom's arms after losing a game that he should have won. Like, none of that matters to me personally. All right, second and 13 for the Broncos here. Hard PA fake from Russ. <laughs> you guys see how much he sold that thing? <laughs> All right, third and 13. This is a tough one. Something tells me we're not going to get a whole lot of offense tonight. Again, heavy on cover two and cover three. 60% of their coverages in, these, in this down at distance is either cover two or cover three. Probably going to depend on receiver distribution. They're presenting cover two pre-snap. Doubt they roll out of it. Yep, it is cover two. Oh, God. Free rusher. All right, so you're at the... 47 yard line might be a little bit too far to consider going for it. So they're probably going to try for a coffin corner punt here and force the bills to drive 90 plus yards, which in theory, as the episode we did a few days ago uh, would show in theory, they can do that. But they haven't done it a lot lately. Also, you saw uh, they had double smash concepts there against cover two. They knew the cover two was there, but the safeties were sitting on it. Uh, DBs played it extremely well. Didn't look like they gave a, a conflict for him in the middle seam, though. I'll have to go back and double check that. But that's kind of one of the things. Actually, I'll draw it out for you. It's commercial break. Who cares? Um, so, all right. Let's say you got... Right, you got receiver, receiver here, and like let's say your receiver here. If you have a flat zone in cover two, and then a safety that's going to be playing this here, 
if you're running smash, right? So let's say you got a you got a hitch, and then you got a corner. If this safety is playing it really really tight, and he's jumping that, and this so this flat corner doesn't have to sink. Pretty much the only way that you're really going to hit cover two, especially if you're running mirrored smash on both sides, is if you're working this middle area of the field, whether it's with a tight end seam or, or you know, maybe it's like a little takeoff or something like that. Like you got to work that area of the field if the safety's like really, really playing this tight. Um, a lot of the times a pole runner, if they're carrying this, they're kind of relying on this safety to be kind of midpointing it so that he can come in and crash while the pole runner, like you kind of want to force air on the ball and then the safety will come and crash that. Uh, but if the safety is expressly like really overplaying this seven route, you want to work the middle of the field because there's nothing there. There's nothing there. So I got to go back and look and see if they did that on the replay. It didn't look like they did. They might want to come back to that if they end up in another third and long situation where you're likely to get cover two from Buffalo. So we'll see. Uh, Riker Gaming for $5. Just watched all 22 of Texans and Bengals, and why have I never noticed how similar CJ and Burrow play? Both were just making big-time throws yesterday. So Panthers fans, earmuffs, all right? <laughs> You're not going to like hearing this. Uh, so Josh McCown, who is the Panthers quarterback's coach, before he took the Panthers quarterback's coach job, he did a film breakdown on the Underdog Fantasy Channel, who's sponsoring this here stream. But if you go to the Underdog Fantasy Channel, not now, go after the game, uh, and you, you look for Josh McCown's film breakdown on C.J. Stroud as a prospect when he was still at Ohio State, he said he was Joe Burrow 2.0. Like, Josh McCown was all the way in on C.J. Stroud. He loved C.J. Stroud. And from my understanding, he took the Panthers' job thinking they were taking C.J. Stroud. Like, that's, at the time, that was my understanding, was that he really, really wanted to coach C.J., and they were going to take C.J. until they weren't going to take C.J. And the prevailing theory, which is a little bit more than a theory at this point, uh, is that Tepper stepped in and, and said, no, we're taking Young. But all I had heard, and this was from multiple people, like three or four people, for months was Stroud to Panthers is a lock, like going to happen, and then it's going to be Bryce Young to the Texans. Like that's what I heard for months. And then a week before the draft, or a couple weeks before the draft, it was actually, <laughs> no, they, they, they might be taking Bryce Young here. And it was a shock to me at the time. I was like, well, what changed, you know? And everybody was kind of cagey about it, which to me just means owner. But from from what I understand at the time, uh, Josh McCown was very much in on C.J. Stroud and uh, would have loved to coach him in Carolina. Not that he didn't love Bryce Young. He loved, he loved Bryce Young, too, but he was obsessed with C.J. Stroud. All right, third and five here. See if the Bills have another long drive in them. Oh, off the hands again. Another stalled drive. This is tough. This is tough to watch. Oh, God, it was catchable, too. Jeez. Was that three now that have hit his receiver's hands? God, this is hard to watch. Like, is it a is it a temperature thing? Is it moist there tonight? Like, what's going on? It can't be that cold there, right? It's November. Good return, get him back out to midfield. And nothing is funnier than an owner thinking he knows better than coaches and shooting his franchise in the foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happens a lot more than you think. 
Happens a lot more than you think. On a cooking expose with my job, so I can't stay long, but thanks for all the content, Brent. Please, for love of God, don't curse the Vikings. Well, I appreciate you, Nathan. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, and no, I'm, I'm going to stay far away from the Vikings, mainly because I really enjoy Josh Dobbs, and uh, I, I want the world for him, and I don't want to be the reason that he fails. So, Vikings, you will not get an episode the rest of the season, unless there's literally nothing else to talk about, but I'm sure I could find something else to talk about. But I don't want to ruin this for Josh Dobbs. Let me lower my light a little bit. Okay, and now we could do that. There we go. All right, a little bit, a little bit better nighttime lighting there. Uh, Brett, will you say hi to my puppy? He's twelve weeks old and a big fan. <laughs> Hello uh, to Will's dog. I think there's a couple other super chats that I missed. Or wait, no, maybe I did catch up. Okay, no, I'm all I'm all caught up. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, what's the biggest, most interesting game left in the season for you? Um, probably Eagles 49ers. I would say, right? Because those are the, the two teams at the top of the NFC. Well, I'm sure Lions fans would have something to say with that. But, like, we know that, that those are going to be two of the three teams remaining at the end of the NFC playoffs, right? So they're going to have to go through each other, most likely. So uh, seeing how they match up against each other is going to be super interesting. Uh, this week's game against Cincy and Baltimore is super interesting because if Cincy doesn't win that game, they're in real trouble in terms of playoff seating because that three game hole in the beginning of the year, like when you look at their schedule in the back half of the season, like their schedule's super tough. And that three game hole to start the year, like they, they really couldn't afford to lose those because they needed to build up a buffer to get through the back half of their schedule. Like if I recall correctly, they're, they're, they're opponent, opponent winning percentage in the back half of the schedule is like the hardest in the entire league. So, let me pull this up. I'll read it off to you guys. So, since he's remaining schedule, after Baltimore, this at Baltimore this Thursday, right? They're hosting the Steelers. They're at Jacksonville. Then you got the Colts. That's a 500 team. Then you got the Vikings. Then you got the Steelers again. Then you got the Chiefs. Then you got the Browns. What's the, what's the, easiest, the, the easiest games Indy? And they're a 500 team, right? But, like, your two easiest remaining games are Indy and Minnesota. And everything else is harder for the rest of the year. Like, your quote-unquote gimme is a team that's won five straight games. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, since he has to win this game, or they're going to be in a rough spot for the rest of the year. Huge hit on Cortland Sutton. On Dorian. Did they just toss Dorian Williams? I don't think they tossed him, right? Anyway, first and ten. All right, wing slot right. Oh, oh, that's nifty. Did you guys see that with the showing the bubble and flash to the bubble outside, and then you got the glance inside, so you're trying to get the DBs to, to jump out? Watch that. So you got the bubble, 
You're trying to get that, that nickel to flash outside to chase the bubble to open up the window for the slant. That's fun. I like that from Sean Payton. It's all about opening those throwing windows. That's a cool play call. All right, Broncos down in the red zone. In two back again. Just going to pound it. I, I don't even know how they got four yards out of that. That should not have gotten four yards, but... By the grace of Javante Williams, they did. All right, not tossed. Good to know. Thank you, chat. All right, another wing look, another run running into the jaws of death. So third and six in the red zone. Do they dare call zero? Probably not. No, I don't. I, I think you'll probably be more conservative here. So I would say if you're getting a two by two look that's spread out, probably palms to both sides. If, they're more condensed, probably match three. It is pretty condensed. Are we going to go quarters here? Uh oh. All right, just short of the sticks. So ESPN's camera is so tight. It's tough for me to see what the coverage is. I couldn't see if they were rolling down into cover three on the motion. It looked like they were in quarters, and then once they rolled, once they motioned into three by one, I thought they might be rolling down the weak safety to get into cover three, but I couldn't tell. It's so much harder to watch football when it's not all twenty-two. <laughs> so much harder. Hate it. All right, so going for a field goal again. So this will be, assuming he makes this. Oh, wait, hold on. Are they trying to get him to jump? That's interesting. That's an interesting way to try to get five yards is you fake a fake field goal, right? You bring out the field goal unit, you fake that it's going to be a fake and that Dixon's going up there to, to run a sneak out of nowhere, trying to get him to jump. Excellent discipline from the Bills' defense to not take that bait, by the way. It would have been very easy for them to take that bait. That's a fun look. It does look like they're going to go for it, by the way. So with all these streaming services, I still need a TV provider to stream NFL games? I mean, I just got it on YouTube TV. which I know is very expensive and it's prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. I wrote it off as a business expense for myself, but um, like, I'm not saying it's cheap. I'm just saying what I use. All right. Fourth and two. This actually is where you might consider zero here. And play the run on the way to the quarterback. Oh, we got to roll out. Oh, my God. Did he get that? Oh, I think he was out. Oh, man, that was close. All right, toe in, drag. Oh, my God, he got that. What? No fucking way. Dude, he was a millimeter in. Oh my god. Oh my god. That's one of the best catches of the year. Like, the actual catch itself, like, fine, yeah, but, like, just the presence of mind... To keep his toe in, 
That's incredible. Oh my God. Cortland Sutton. Take a bow. Also, great throw from Russ, too, to give him a chance. That's a that's an incredible play. The balls from Sean to go for it. Everything. Top down. Great. 10 out of 10. No notes. That's like the definition of toe drag swag. Um, wow. That's, that's amazing. Uh, Brian Force for $5. Hey, Brett, love your content. Discovered you through Chris Harris. Did you still stand by your Roshan eval or has something changed with him? Uh, no, I still stand by it. You know, um, I think Foreman has also looked fantastic. Uh, I think Roshan, you know, obviously dealing with the injuries this year has been, has been tough for him. But he's had some really nice runs. Like, he's flashed the talent. He's flashed the juice. Um, I would say he hasn't been... Uh, he hasn't he hasn't been letting the blocks develop, like, in terms of, like, the pace of him actually hitting on all these, like, inside zone and, and outside zone and stuff. I feel like he is hitting it a little bit too quickly at times, whereas Foreman's a little bit more patient. He kind of lets it develop. He'll, he'll kind of, like give like a little bit of a nod backside in order to get somebody to jump and then he'll hit front side again. Like I think Foreman's running with better patience, but in terms of just raw juice, like Roshan's still, he looks great, you know, running through contact, everything like that. He's got to, got to improve vision. That's all. There we go. Touchdown stands. Hell of a play by Cortland Sutton. I mean, that's like literally, that's not even inches. That is millimeters that he was in. That's nuts. As a Dallas fan, I know a lot about owners shooting a team in the foot. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. But Jerry hasn't done it as much in the last 10 years. I would say when uh, there, there was a turning point. Oh, my God, he missed the extra point. Come on now. It's a Thursday game on a Monday. That's what this is. There was a turning point in Dallas, though. I would say it was 2014 when Jerry was, like, you know, about to grab the phone and take Johnny Menzel and just, like, yeet his franchise into the sun. And the people around him, you know, Will McClay, as well as Jerry's kid, um, uh, Stephen Jones. I shouldn't say Jerry's kid. He's, like, a grown man, right? <laughs> but Jerry's son, Stephen Jones, as well as Will McClay, like kind of like talking him off the ledge and saying like, no, we're going to take Zach Martin. We're going to take the actual good football player here. And Jerry listening to them and, and not caving into his demons and letting the football people make the football decision. And then they draft a Hall of Fame talent in Zach Martin. And I think it became immediately apparent that Zach Martin was really, really good and that uh, Johnny was not going to be what Jerry thought he was going to be. And so Jerry, I think from that moment forward, was like, you know, I'm going to trust my football people. They talked me off the ledge. They were right. I'm going to let them do it. And Dallas has been an excellent drafting team ever since then. Like, I really do think that 2014 draft was a turning point for them. Because in terms of, like, draft hit rate, they're right up at the top of the NFL. And I think it's because Jerry got a lot better at letting his football people do the draft. Now, in terms of spending... The Zeke contract, that was all Jerry. And that put him in a bad hole. Bad hole. Um, like, Jerry has spent some money unwisely. Draft-wise, though, he's he has not meddled. And that's good. Uh, Dennis Marquez for $5. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate you. Thank you for supporting the show. Who's down on the field? Can any of you guys? Oh, it's Cam Lewis. Oh, man. That's unfortunate. I didn't see what happened to him. Who was the last Cowboy draft miss? 
like a high high draft pick, you mean? Well, let me look. Hold on. I off the top of my head, the, the fact that I can't remember a bad Cowboys bust says a lot about how good they've been at drafting. So their last first round picks in order have been Tyler Smith, he's amazing. Micah Parsons, obviously amazing. C D Lamb, amazing. Um they didn't have a first rounder in twenty nineteen. But they did get uh, Tony Pollard and Donovan Wilson in that class. Uh, let's see. Before that, in round one, they had Leighton Van Der Esch. Solid. Would not consider that a bust. Before that, they had Taco Charlton. So I guess Taco Charlton's like the last bust, I would say, in Dallas. And that was seven years ago. Like, I think you're allowed a bust once every seven years. Like, the typical first round hit rate's 50%. So. That's pretty good. And then the year before that, you know, they had Zeke. And then the year before that, they had Byron Jones, who has some decent years. And then before that, it was Zach Martin, right? And, and even before that, it was Travis Frederick. So in terms of, like, first round, like, outright, no doubt about a bus, they've had two since 2012. It was Taco Charlton and Morris Claiborne. And shit, he can go back before that. Tyron was in 2011. Dez was in 2010. Like, it's, <laughs> Cowboys first round picks are pretty damn good going back the last 14 years. That's actually really impressive. That might be the best first round hit rate in the league. That's really impressive. Damn. Washington always overdrafts players. I I mean, I will say the Emmanuel, Emmanuel Forbes over Christian Gonzalez, uh, even at the time, I was like, and, and there's nothing against Emmanuel Forbes. Like, I, he had actually his last full game before the ejection this week, but his last full game was his best game. He had four pass breakups. He looked really good. Um, but even at the time, I was like, Forbes over Gonzalez? What? What did I miss? Oh, there we go. Cook gets back on the field, immediately breaks three tackles and gets eight yards. How about that? The man's motivated. Jamin Davis. Yeah, that one That one didn't work out like I thought it would. I actually was a fan of Jamin when he was coming out. A lot of teams were. Um, like He was actually a very well-liked prospect. It just did not work. I really don't know why. Second and two, there's that, there's that tackle pull. Watch this on the replay, guys. Deion Dawkins. Watch him pull here. There it is. See, they're running power away from the three technique. They're going to back block with the backside guard, get the center on the second level. Deion comes through. There you go. They do it every single week. Look at that. The whiteboard translated. <laughs> and Cook is running like a man possessed. <laughs> they're just feeding him now. Uh, Brett, I know you've already made an Eagles video, but have you thought about making a Jalen Carter vid? I am making a Jalen Carter video, but it is not for my channel. It will be on the NFL's channel. So I am working on that, but uh, not for me. I mean, it is for me, but not for this channel. All right, third down. I know, three runs in a row. It is possible. All, all it took was the offense not working for like a solid quarter and a half for them to be like, hmm, maybe we should do this more. Look, at another one. How about that? Oh, Dion just got ran into, but he's okay. Thank God. Keep running it, Ken. Just call it again. Call the run until it doesn't work. All right. Oh, oh, Diggs broke it. This is the Bills offense we thought we were going to see. They are playing extremely pissed. 
but we are now in the dreaded 50-yard line to 30-yard line area of the field where they have consistently stalled out. Can they finish it? That's the question. And they ran. And they ran. Oh, my God. (laughs) You can teach an old dog new tricks. Let's fucking go. They ran and got an explosive play. Oh, my God. I never thought I'd see it. That's amazing. Maybe they did watch the video. (laughs) And they scored! And it's Kincaid! Let's go! (laughs) Let's go! Needed that. Needed that. Oh my god, I'm so happy. Man. Oh, and they just caught him. They caught him in cover two. The corner didn't sink. Oh no, they were in they were invert. Was that invert two? I saw Sertan as the high guy. That might have been two invert. I gotta double check that. Cause Sertan was high, and then you got a flat player, which I think was Justin Simmons. I think they might have been inverted there. And then Simmons just didn't didn't carry number one. Did he expect Sertan to midpoint it? That's the question I have. I really want to see another view of that. Because if Simmons thought that Sertan was midpointing one and two and then getting help inside, I can see why he would have stuck down low in the flat. But Sertan was carrying number two, which then just meant Simmons just let number one go, which was Kincaid. Hmm. Would love to get a replay. I don't think ESPN is going to give us that, though. They're going for two. Huh, okay. Nine and eight, or nine to eight if they get it. It looked like a college baseball game out here. So, Stefan against Sertan, one-on-one outside. And there it is to Gabe. All right, they got it. We got a ball game. Well, this game suddenly got a lot more entertaining. (laughs) Oh, he just hit the seven away from leverage. Yeah. Um, for There's a question on Georgia's mint package. There's a lot there. Hold on. Let me pull up the link to it. Uh, my buddy Cody Alexander did a much better explain it, much better job explaining it than I ever would. So let me drop that link into chat. Because, A, Cody's awesome and you should read his work. And, B, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot that goes into to Mint. And it's interesting because, like, Georgia and Bama have kind of gotten away from running it in the last year or so. They don't, you don't even run it as much as they used to. And really... Um, yeah, same thing for tight, like tight as well. Um, they don't run that as much as they used to because counter would just absolutely wreck them, right? And teams knew that it would because just the angles of counter against tight 
It's just, it's a really, it's a really tough play to stop. You run tight to stop zone. You don't run tight to stop counter. And so teams just lean into counter and absolutely kill them. So they don't, they don't run it as much these days. All right. Broncos got a chance to answer and go into the half. Because they, they can score and then get the ball back because they, they received the kickoff in the second half. So they can score and then get the ball back and score again if they play this right. Oh, great ball from Russ. Also, I don't know if you guys hear the fire truck outside. <laughs> I apologize if you do. Clearly something is happening. Uh, thoughts on Min Michigan's punishment and college football playoff picks. That's from uh, Jay Cornett for $5. Um, what was interesting, and I, I got to do more research on it, but what I found interesting about the Michigan punishment is they said, we found no evidence that Harbaugh knew anything, but we're going to suspend him anyway because he's the face of the program. And so I'm like, so you, you, found, you found no evidence that Harbaugh knew about it, but you're suspending him just because – fuck Michigan it was just weird it, it, I don't know the whole thing felt kind of rushed like it felt like they just they it felt like they did an action before they finished the investigation just odd and I think it's because they were feeling pressure from all the other Big Ten coaches to do something but it's like they didn't even find any evidence Harbaugh knew about it Oh, another nice run from Javanta. Uh, let's see if there's any other super chats that I missed. Uh, who was the worst drafting team in the past decade? Jags, Raiders, I don't know, Bears even. I would probably say Raiders. Let me look up the Raiders draft history. I'm sure it's a wreck. Hold on. I mean, the Raiders just had a draft class a couple years ago, and there's nobody left on the team. So Raiders first-round picks the last 10 years or so. You got Tyree Wilson, who knows. Uh, then they didn't have one in 2022. They had Alex Leatherwood in 2021. Uh, they had Ruggs, in, Ruggs and Damon Arnett in 2020. Uh, Farrell and then Josh Jacobs in 2019. So Jacobs was a hit. Oh, and then Jonathan Abram as well. Abram was not a hit. So what, that's like one hit in seven first-round picks. Uh, and then you got Colton Miller in 2018. That one's a hit. Uh, Gary on Conley in 2017. That was a miss. Carl Joseph in 2016. That was a miss. 2015 Amari Cooper hit, uh, and Mario Edwards. I mean, Mario Edwards is still in the league, I think. So yeah, it wasn't like a terrible bust, but oh no, he's a second rounder. Never mind. Well, either way, Amari hit. That was first rounder. Uh, Cleo Mack that hit in 2014. DJ Hayden, uh, rest in peace, by the way. He just passed away this week. If you guys didn't see that, uh, he got into an accident. And uh, unfortunately, uh, passed away. I think he was only like 36. But um, DJ Hayden in 2013. Again, just awful story. Hope his family's hope his family is taken care of. Um, before that, Tony Bergstrom in 2012. That one didn't hit. Uh, Stefan Wisniewski in 2011. I mean, I, oh no, he was a second round pick. But Wisniewski wasn't bad, honestly. Rolando McLean in 2010. He was good for a while, <laughs> at least. Darius Hayward Bay in 2009. Or in 2009, he was he was okay, but he was never he never became what people thought he would. So yeah, I would say Raiders probably up there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Rugs and Arnett in the same year. The, the entire draft class that year, it was, um, 
So Henry Ruggs, Damon Arnett, Lynn Bowden, Brian Edwards, Tanner Muse, John Simpson. I think John Simpson's the only one still there. Oh, and Amik Robertson. So the only two guys that are still on the team. Oh, no, Simpson's not there. Uh, Simpson's in, um, where is he, Miami? Right? I think Simpson's in Miami. So I think the only one that's still there is Amik Robertson. All right, 90 seconds left, first and 10. I'll check the Jags at halftime. I want to check in on this drive because they're almost in the red zone. So let's see. Second and long. Hmm. Typically going to be middle field close structures uh, in this particular down and distance, probably because they expect a lot of second and long runs. I would say from a clock management clock management perspective, you can expect a run here, uh, thinking if they're going to try to drain clocks. So that's going to signal most likely call here for the Bills is going to be cover three. If the Broncos don't want to run the ball, See what's their timeout situation. Let's see, it's one fifteen. Come on, show the timeouts. All right, they got two timeouts, one fifteen. Yeah, I would probably run the ball here. You want to force Buffalo to use one. Now, as for what your favorite run call is on second and long, just outside the red zone. Oh, they're, they're throwing it. Better not be incomplete. All right. He ran. We'll count it as a run. Uh-oh, flag. Oh, man. It's going to back him up. So the reason why I say I would rather run there is because if we can get four to five yards and then force Buffalo to use a timeout, it means that if we don't get the third down when we throw it, um, you know, they'll have a minute and one timeout instead of a minute and two timeouts. And so you're kinda you're kinda playing the clock here too, right? But now, see second and twenty, now you kinda gotta throw it. Cause you're out of field goal range at this point. They're lined up in an offset eye. Why would you run into this? Hold on. They, they better not run. What's he doing? Why would you run on second and 20 when you're not in field goal range? Like you're at the 40, so it's a 57-yard field goal now. It's third and 16. I don't I don't think I agree with that call. Unless you run it like the time to run was before you had 20 yards to go for a first down. Cuz now if you throw an incompletion, it's going to be a 57-yard field goal, which is not makeable. I mean, not typically makeable. So, like, you're almost, like, incentivized to run it again on third and 16 to make it, like, a 52, 53-yarder. But, like, once it's second and 20 and you're out of field goal range, you might as well just throw. Make them take the timeout. I, I mean, I I understand that, but 
it's it's more about like yardage, right? It's about being in field goal range versus not in field goal range. Once they got knocked out of field goal range, I think the equation changes for me personally. Now, this rush scramble got him back to the 30 regardless, so it helped. But I'm talking like from a process perspective, once you're knocked out of field goal range, you have to be aggressive to get back into field goal range. They're very fortunate that Russ was able to do something with his feet there. From a process perspective, I disagree with their process. Because, like, what happens if you run on second and 20 to get to the 40 and then you throw on third and 16 and expose yourself to taking a sack? Like, I don't know. It just, the whole thing seemed weird to me. Like, it worked. It worked out. Not sure I agree with the call, though. All right, so it'll be a 49-yard attempt, much more makeable than the 57 it would have been. Did he sneak it in? He snuck it in. All right, so it'll be 45 seconds, no timeouts. Not impossible for Buffalo to to go down and try to get a field goal here, but they're going to have to bomb it down the field to make that happen. And, you know, C.J. Stroud ain't walking through that door. So. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to be obnoxious about it. <laughs> uh, let's see. You mean Josh play hero ball, the Bills' favorite thing? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Either way, you know, the Broncos being up on the road at the half, getting the ball back in the second half, like this is as good of a position as they could hope to be in. And, and good for them for doing that, by the way. Watch all your vids, but first time watching live with my game synced. Pretty fun, Brett. Thanks. Well, thank you for being here. Um, also, by the way, for everybody that is here, we do this every Thursday over on the podcast channel, the Bootleg Football Podcast. So make sure to stop by there. Um, and, and every single Thursday, come say hi. This week is a doozy. We got Bengals, Ravens. And then also, uh, you know, every single stream is also sponsored by Underdog. So we got a QR code on the screen if you feel like submitting any sort of halftime entries because you can live play during games on underdog and we'll probably go through a couple of those at halftime but uh that qr code will match your deposit oh we got big oh my god josh allen's gonna give me an aneurysm are you fucking kidding me <laughs> i mean What are we doing, Josh? What are we doing? Oh, he just left it so far inside. Oh, my God. It's so far in. That's a bad ball. That's a bad ball. Also, DB was literally staring at you the entire time, okay? They know you're working the sidelines. You have no timeouts. Like, he's literally playing directly on top of the receiver. Like, this is not, you know, oh, he's inside leverage and he's got no shot at it. He's literally sitting on the sideline waiting for you to throw it. What are you doing? Good God. And the Broncos still have two timeouts. Like, they're going to get another opportunity to score here. That's just horrific. That's just horrific. I just... Well, either way, there's one of our Jaleel McLaughlin catches. So hopefully we get another one. <laughs> we need that one. 
how hilarious would it be if like the one thing we don't get tonight is field goals after I made an episode specifically about how the bills don't get field goals. I feel like I would deserve that, right? Like I would, I would deserve them not kicking a field goal because I literally spent an entire week telling myself that this team doesn't get field goals. I'm an idiot. Oy. Unbelievable. Let me see what the live ones are right now. Is there... Oh, there's our our second McLaughlin catch. There we go. We hit on that one too. All right, so we're three out of five. If we hit on the last two, we win $680. Looking at live right now let's go oh we know that josh is gonna be just heaving it or maybe they will come if they get a field goal here i think they run more if they if they give up a touchdown i think they're gonna pass a lot if they give up a field goal i think they'll run so maybe i'll save the bills for the result of this Third and six. <laughs> Josh Allen scientifically does not have that dog in him. <laughs> oh, man. It just it happens every week, man. So this is a interesting spot for the Broncos because if they work the middle of the field, they got to really haul ass to go spike. They got to go, 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 go. Just like that. They might get two plays if they can spike it right. Oh, no, they're doing a... Okay. They got it off. Oh, no, it was third down. They couldn't spike it. That's why. Oh, I missed that. First of all, I'm dumb. Second of all, that's really impressive. Like, from a procedural perspective, to know that if you don't get a first down, you got to haul ass. Like, everybody's got to be on it. You know, swapping units. Like, that's really, really impressive. Why can't you spike on third? Uh, it already was third. That's that. So I missed that it was already third down. I thought it was second down. So it was already fourth. That means you can't spike it. So they had to run everybody out there with like 15 seconds. That's really impressive. That's like the that's something you practice one time in training camp so that everybody knows what to do. And then it comes up four months later, right? Good for them. All right. Looking at halftime. So they got a field goal. Score is, what, 15 to 8. I'm going to guess that they're going to run. There's no running backs up yet. So let's do the other side of that and say that Singleton. Let's do Singleton tackles. And then we'll do we'll do Justin Simmons assists. Just assuming they're gonna run the shit out of the ball. Let's do lower on Allen attempts against my better judgment. Because <laughs> part of me thinks they're gonna come out and just fucking fling it, but also I think they might run it, learning from the one drive that actually worked tonight. If they do throw it, though, who will it be? Let me get... I think they might work Kincaid a little bit in their RPO game. Yeah, I'll just do a four-banger on that. That sounds good to me. 
and we'll ensure it. So we only need to get three out of four. Boom. Just wait for that to go through. Too many turnovers. I mean, that's the story of Buffalo's life this year is too many turnovers. Like consistently that's that's been their their problem. Like they, they're averaging almost two turnovers a game for the last month and a half. And this week unfortunately is no different. Like they have two in the first half alone. Uh, Brett, thoughts on that Sutton catch? Uh, I think it was one of the best examples of toe drag swag that we have ever seen. Like the the presence of mind to have his like toenails three millimeters from the sideline is just wild, just absolutely wild. Uh, is it safe to say Josh Allen is not in the convo for quarterbacks you want to have on a last minute game winning drive? <laughs> At this point. Probably like at, at this point in terms of last minute game winning drive, who do you want? Obviously Patrick Mahomes. Um, I would say, Ooh, that, that's a good question. Like top, top five quarterbacks that you want late in the game, Patrick Mahomes, probably Justin Herbert. Um, <laughs> can he pick it depends is it the fourth quarter <laughs> if it's the fourth quarter you might actually have a case cj stroud i mean i know it's early but i mean how much more evidence do you need um burrow that last game notwithstanding i would still say burrow uh I know some people are saying Cousins. That's not a terrible answer. I think over the last year and a half, he's kind of proven that. He was like the fifth guy. Like, Hmm. Stafford? Hmm. I can see Stafford. I mean, he literally came up clutch in the Super Bowl, like the actual Super Bowl. So, can't really hold that against him. The pastronaut. <laughs> uh, there we go. All right, now they finally refreshed. All right, let's get these up. So let's see, what did we want? We wanted Josh Allen lower on pass attempts. We want Cook higher on rushing yards. We want Dalton Kincaid. Actually, no. Let's go to the defensive side now. Do we want Javanta? Hmm. I'm trying to fill out my, my underdog entry for the second half here. And I am struggling, chat. By the way, link in the description. You can still fill them out during, during halftime yourself as well if you're already on underdog. And if you're not already on underdog, uh, if you use the link in the description below in the promo code, they match your deposit up to 100 bucks. I think we still have like 10 minutes left in halftime, so... There's still time to play. God, what do I want? Do I want passing attempts? I feel like we might. Like I know they're going to try to run the ball, but I kind of expect the Bills to play a shitload of cover three in the second half because they weren't they weren't stopping the run from the two eye structures as well. So let's go. Let's go passing attempts higher on Russell, and then. Let's go 
higher on Cortland receiving yards. That sounds good to me. Oh, shit. The grassy posse's here. <laughs> oh, man. Is, is is Tom doing his own stream, or is, is he with Perna tonight because it's a Broncos game? I, I haven't, obviously, I haven't got a chance to check out his stream, but hello to the grassy posse. And Perna's here as well. Perna, how you feeling? Is this the new, 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 new best game ever? <laughs> There we go. Uh, we we do love uh, Perna and Grassi around here. Two of my favorite people in uh, in the NFL YouTube space. Um, Perna's growth, by the way. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of um, Broncos fans in here. To see Brandon Perna's growth over the last not even year, I'd say over the last like two months. Like his, his channel's always been huge, but you know, I, I think his his content has finally reached a wider audience after what, like seven, eight years, maybe even more grinding on YouTube. And he's like, for whatever reason, the algorithm gods finally blessed him and introduced his content to a wider audience, and more people have finally gotten to experience that good sports and everything that he has on that channel, and like how entertaining it is, and um you know, how poignant his commentary is on like obviously serious topics, but like how funny he is, you know, obviously the, there's a lot of Broncos fans that have found him too, but I've really loved seeing that somebody who's grinded for so long and whose content is still like, it's not like he drastically changed his content. It's more so YouTube finally like recognized, like the algorithm finally recognized like, Hey, people really enjoy this content. Let me blast it out to a wider audience. And you know, to see uh, Brandon's success and all the channel growth in the last two months um, has just been really, really awesome. And it kind of gives hope, I think, to a lot of other creators that have been doing this for a long time and like waiting for that breakthrough. It kind of gives them an example to look to of somebody who just works really hard. And then finally, for whatever reason, the algorithm, uh, you know, lets them have the success they deserve. But like he, he, he hasn't changed anything himself. His content is still just as great as it ever has been. But now he's finally getting, you know, the attention and, and, the, and the views that he's always deserved. And I'm just really happy to see that. And I'm happy that he finally uh, has finally gotten recognized for how good of work he does. And, and I would say same thing for Grassi. You know, the 30 and 30 obviously w was huge. But to get nominated for fan of the year by the Packers is just massive. And he's a lifelong Packers fan, so that's a dream come true. But I don't know. It's just great to see, like, good people have have – success when you know how hard they've worked for a long time and Brandon and Tom have both worked so hard for such a long time day in day out and both of them are just having huge huge years this year and that's amazing so shout out to them they're awesome and I'm proud of them off topic the backdrop is insane yes welcome to my apartment <laughs> uh, I promise that side of the camera is a disaster. There's just <laughs> I have not cleaned my office in a while, <laughs> so you're you're seeing the nice side of the office. <laughs> uh, any malort tonight? No, I'm taking a week off the malort. I only have a little bit of that bottle left, by the way. Uh, so I'm, I gotta preserve it, you know, I gotta, I gotta save it for like the next bears episode that I do or something tonight. It's just whiskey. It's just 13 monkeys specifically they serve it in a Mason jar. <laughs> I've been watching Perna suffer since the days of the Lynch Simeon battle. Glad to see the suffering finally met with success. Yeah. All it took was losing by 70 <laughs> or, or whatever that Dolphins game was. Like that was the video that like really, really popped. And, and I remember like we were in a group chat <laughs> and like he hit like a million views on that post Dolphins game video. He hit, he hit a million views in like two days on it, maybe even less. And we were all just losing our mind. We were so happy for him. 
It was great. It was great. Uh, down low B, how are you doing tonight, Mr. Coleman? Uh, I am doing wonderful. We got a decent football game on. We've got good whiskey. We've got a good chat. Uh, you know, our our underdog entry, we're at three out of five already at halftime. We just need Tyler Bass to kick field goals and Vaughn Miller to get a revenge sack on the Broncos, and we're good to go. That'll pay out $680 for us because we stacked so many boosts together. So I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. Uh, would you ever consider opening a bar? Yes, I would. I don't know anything about running a bar, so I would have to hire people that know a lot about running a bar to help me not fuck that up. But uh, I would love to. Yeah. If I ever like make a ton of money from YouTube to the point where uh, like I don't have to spend 70 hours a week on it, <laughs> uh, I, I would probably open a bar. Either that or I would... Go get like a master's in history and then be a history teacher. I know two very different jobs, but two things that I would think about. Uh, Brett, is it okay to feel hope again for the Broncos? Yeah, I would say so. Um, obviously, the season started out rough, but they've steadily improved throughout the year. I think by the end of the year, we will qualify them as a solid, like middle of the pack team with some upside and hope for the future. I think I think you know the outlook on Russ is a lot more positive now than it was 2 months ago. And um so it's a credit to Sean Payton for for trying to get the best out of him and, and getting the best out of him. Like again, I this this season so far has made me think there's a little bit of gas still left in the Russell Wilson tank. So that's a success. And if they can just have Russ be like average and continue to build the roster around him and have a solid couple drafts here in a row and have a solid free agency, like the Broncos will be fine. Like the main goal of this season was like, let's save Russ. And I think they've done a good job of, of saving Russ so far. All right, start of the third quarter. Speaking of Russ, he's back out there now. Uh, you live in Cali, Brett? Yes, I am right in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. I know the skyline behind me is blurred, so it's probably not recognizable, but that's where I'm at. DTLA. Well, like we said, I thought the Bills were going to run a lot of cover three. Coming out in the second half, and they run cover three. First play. Uh, Brett, do you agree with Matt Miller that Shadur Sanders is better than Drake May? No. I'm curious to read his eval to understand where, like, how he got to that point, though. That's the part I'm interested in. Was what is it? What is it that he's seeing? Um, yeah, that's, I've not heard that take. That's interesting. Ooh, we got a hold. That's going to bring it back regardless of what this is. How are you able to do the underdog stuff if you work with the Chargers? Uh, I mean, the Chargers didn't have a problem with it. I mean, I, I had the underdog contracts long before I started working with the Chargers, so like they knew about it. I was wondering why the vid quality was so bad. YouTube had me automatically at 144p. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That'll do it. Wait, what kind of history would you teach? Uh, I would teach... I don't, I don't know. There's a few different periods that I really like. Um, you know, I would say like Bronze Age history I'm super interested in but also uh, like Revolutionary War, very interested in. Oh, man, what a great run from Javanta. He's got juice, man. Like, I think his knee is all the way back. Also, I think he might have just hurt Taylor Rapp on that one. Taylor Rapp is <laughs> struggling to move his right arm right now.
Yeah, I think Rap's shoulder met William's shoulder, and William's shoulder won. Ooh. I guarantee you. So I'm not saying I agree with it, but I guarantee you Javonta Williams is going to get fined for that because he lowered his crown. Guarantee it. He's going to get fined. Like, come come back to this part in the stream. What are we, two hours, 20 minutes, 28 seconds in? And, and, and mark this part of the stream. Javonta Williams is going to get fined for that. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying it's going to happen. How often does Brett think of Rome? Uh, at least once a week, because every time I do my patron-only Q&A session on the Discord, they always ask me about Roman history. <laughs> so at least once a week. All right, third and 17. Not a whole lot in the playbook for this one. Do they come after him? I don't know if they're going to blitz. They're probably going to back out. Yeah, they just brought a sim pressure there. Oh, God, Dorian Williams got crushed. Yeah, the Q&A is always Rome. Yes. For people that don't know, by the way, uh, patrons to this channel, if you're in the Discord tier of the Patreon, which is $5 a month, and it gives you access to the patron-only section of the Discord, uh, which is where I also post episodes early, like the day before they go live. I post episodes in the patron-only Discord. Um, and also, you know, I get feedback on thumbnails and titles from the patron-only Discord. And, and you know, I, they, they help me out with a lot of, like, the, the packaging of the video in terms of, you know, what images are the prettiest. Uh, but they also see the episodes early in there, and we also do a Q&A every single week on the patron-only Discord. On uh, Well, tomorrow's is, was it, 1, one Eastern. I know my mods are in here somewhere. 1 Eastern is, uh, is the time for the Q&A tomorrow. So if you are already a patron, make sure to come to that. And if you can't make 1 Eastern for the live Q&A, obviously, uh, you know, we, we post the recording of it on the Patreon every single week, but... Yeah, if you're interested in doing Q&A, that's there for you. I know, but great salesman. Thank you, Hockey's One Eastern. Yeah, my mods start. <laughs> my mods keep telling me to promote the Discord more, and I'm like, <laughs> I always feel like I always feel like the like the scummiest like used car salesman <laughs> when, I, when I sell people on anything. So I'm like, <laughs> come join us. World War One gets so little chatter. Chatter. Everyone is Civil War or World War Two. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do World War One uh, and teach World War One just because it's so depressing. Like there, there was nothing positive about World War One. It was just. It, it was a. It was a battle between all these countries uh, in a competition to see who could be the most miserable. Like the, God, the World War One. Like if I had to fight in any war. Like modern war out of any of them, World War One is at the absolute bottom of the list. It was hell. Extremely depressing subject. Like, you either die of disease, you die of gas, you die of machine guns, you die of tanks, like you die, you die, like you just die. <laughs> World War One, you just die. Horrific, horrific conflict. Very depressing class to take. Uh, Brett, not trying to spam, not serve you shot. Uh, I don't know if you saw. Uh, here's Matt Miller's top 50 with Shadur over Drake. Is there a link? I'll just look it up. I'll, I'll, I'll Google Matt Miller's top 50. Um, very interesting that he had him over Drake, though. Did not expect that.
What coverage do the Rams run the most? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Let me add them into my little my little thing here. Hold on. So, on in terms of overall coverages that the Rams run the most, they are cover three barely, but they're a heavy quarters and quarter quarter half team. If you look at quarters and quarter quarter half combined, they're at what is that 44 percent ish, uh, which is a lot. That's up towards the top of the league in terms of combined quarters and quarter quarter half for for the Rams. That is. You compare that to God. What's the what's the Colts? <laughs> I'm sure the Colts is just insane for cover three. So, yeah, it was 26% cover three for the Rams. Colts are 47% cover three. So, again, different styles, different styles. All right, fourth and two. They're going for it. They kind of have to with the way this game is gone. Like, I totally get it. Can he convert? Oh, he had him. He had Khalil Shakir. Oh. Again, there's so many missed opportunities. So many missed opportunities for the Bills in this game. This has got to be infuriating. I'll, I bet you the stands are, uh, especially all these people have been drinking all day. Fans are probably a very angry place right now. Boy, this is rough. This is rough. Just a, just a bad game. Uh, slushy cat for two forty. Brett thoughts on the Browns mainly Watson. Um. So here's here, and we kind of talk about this a little bit on the podcast tomorrow, because I've been getting into it a lot with Browns fans today in terms of like what what yesterday's performance was, right? In the the comeback against the Ravens, he was fourteen of fourteen in the second half. That is correct. He was six of twenty two in the first half. That is correct. If you look at the types of throws, and again, I watched I watched the film on every single throw because I, I, I just wanted to be as accurate about this as I possibly could. If you watch the first half, we were 6 of 22. The average depth of target was like 15 yards down the field, and they had four deep balls dialed up for Watson of 20-plus yard depth. He didn't hit on a single one of them. There was a, a go ball. He threw four yards out of bounds. Um, there was another one where he – was too long by like four yards. There was um, a corner post that they dialed up against a middle field close structure where the post had flattened down like he was taught to do. And you're literally supposed to drill it to the deep middle of the field before he gets to the hook defender that's coming from the other side. Like it was there. He had it. The window was there. You got to fucking drill it. Didn't take it. Took off, threw it away. Um, So they dialed up some deep shots. Watson didn't hit him. You could say, like, clearly injury affecting him, fine. I will accept that premise, right? I will accept the premise that because of the injury, Watson just doesn't have the ability to stretch the field. They tried it, didn't work. So you get to the second half. They're like, we got to score points. What are we going to do? And this is where he went 14 to 14 by literally having an average depth of target of 5.9 yards the entire second half. They threw short of, the, short of the sticks 87% of the time. You had David Njoku with 58 receiving yards and 61 receiving yards after the catch. His average depth of target was 1.4 yards. David Njoku is a grown-ass man who was dragging Ravens the entire day. You know, everybody just dragging Ravens the entire day. They got so much yards after the catch. But he only had two throws in the second half longer than six yards past the sticks, right? And they were two curl routes. So it was not exactly a high difficulty of throws that Watson was making. He hit 14 of 14. That's good. He was efficient. That's good. But 
I, I just, I, I struggle with the narrative of like, you know, Deshaun Watson came out there and like was dealing and it's like, he was dealing. Like if you looked at the passing chart, it's like five, like his average depth of target was like five yards. <laughs> like that's dealing. Like, and it's so funny to see Browns fans like trash Kenny Pickett for doing the exact same thing. And it's like, what the fuck do you think Watson just did? He's like, it's fine. He was fine. And I think it's okay to just say he was fine. He was fine. That's what it is. But at the same time, you're paying a quarterback $230 million. He better not be fine. So that's where I struggle with it is I think Browns fans, and I, I do not hold this against Browns fans whatsoever. I, I've tailgated a muni lot with Browns fans. I think they're a lovely bunch of people. Do not have any problem with Browns fans. Even if they have a problem with me, I do not have an issue with them. But I understand where they're at psychologically right now. Like, I get it. Like, they are vehemently defending Deshaun Watson to the core because they have to. Like, they know that they are stuck with Deshaun Watson. So he better work out. Because if Deshaun Watson does not work out, they are fucked. Like, completely, utterly, raw dog fucked. A franchise has never been so fucked as this one will be if Deshaun Watson doesn't work out, okay? Unheard of levels. Like, songs will be written, poems will be uh, uh, spoken about their level of fuckedness if Deshaun Watson doesn't work out. And so they got to believe he will. And so they got to defend him, like, to their core because they, they got to believe, right? And their, their psyche is hanging on by a thread, because they got a quarterback whose average depth of target is five yards. And they're like, cool. Like, they, they got to they gotta really commit to it, you know, while also clowning Kenny Pickett for doing the same thing. So, like, I get it. I get it. Like, they're just being fans. But my job is not to be a Browns fan. My job is to look at the situation objectively. And the objective situation is that you can name, at minimum, five quarterbacks in their own conference who have, been, who have played better than Deshaun Watson since he became a Cleveland Brown. And if you're paying $230 million for a quarterback, he better not be the 10th best one in his own conference. So that's where I'm at with Deshaun. Like, the team is incredible. The Browns roster is incredible. Deshaun has been mid. And I don't think it's that controversial to say that Deshaun has been mid and that you're paying him too much for him to be mid. Like, is, is that controversial? I don't think so. But I also don't begrudge Browns fans for disagreeing with him and clowning me on Twitter or whatever because that's what they're going to do. Like, they have to believe that their quarterback is better than that. Oh, God, did Cortland get the—I think we got a turnover. Unless somebody touched out of bounds while they recovered it. We'll see. That's going to get reviewed. Anyway, hope that made sense to the chat. I got no problem with Browns fans, even if they got a problem with me because— at the end of the day, my job is to not make them feel better about this. <laughs> my job is to be as objective about it as I possibly can. Can't tell on that replay if anybody was touching out of bounds when I got recovered, so it sounds like it's going to be Bill's ball, which they desperately needed. So mid means terrible, not average. No, I mean mid, like just mid. Like I don't, I don't think Deshaun's been terrible, but I do think he's been mid. Like again, if he's like the tenth best quarterback in his conference, that's I would say that's mid. But also, like if we're looking at quarterbacks overall in the NFL and you know because let's just let's just run through the list right AFC Mahomes I would I would if, give me a choice between Deshaun and any of these quarterbacks Mahomes taking Deshaun Allen I'm sorry <laughs> Mahomes I'm taking Mahomes Allen I'm taking Allen Burrow versus Deshaun I'm taking Burrow uh Lawrence I'm taking Lawrence Herbert I'm taking Herbert Lamar taking Lamar Stroud taking Stroud um Who else is there? 
Uh, let's see, AFC East. Uh, Tua, taking Tua. So what, that's eight already? Kenny, that, that one's kind of a push to me. Uh, Levis, I don't know, we haven't seen enough. AR, we haven't seen enough. Um, Russ, like Russ is where you like start to argue, right? So it's like you're you're starting to argue. Uh, Rogers without torn Achilles, like I I guess, but you know, again, I'm talking about like right now. So like you're starting to argue for Deshaun at like maybe the ninth spot in the conference when comparing him to Russ, right? So now you add in the NFC. Hurts, you're taking Hurts. Dak, you're taking Dak. Uh, anybody in the NFC South? Like, again, you're putting them up against Carr, Baker. Like, I, I, it's close, right? It's a push there. You know, NFC North, uh, Cousins, before Cousins injury, it would have been him. Um, you're not taking him, you're not taking love over Deshaun. Uh, you're not taking... You're probably not taking anybody on the Bears over Deshaun. You know, you get out to the West. You're taking Geno over Deshaun. Based on play this year, you're definitely taking Purdy over Deshaun. You're taking Stafford. So it's like, again, we're, we're, we're more than 16 quarterbacks deep across the entire NFL. Mid. That's mid. Not bad. Mid. And I think it's fair to say that Deshaun's been mid. Goff, absolutely, you're correct. So again, we're looking at like, what, 18, 17, 18 in the NFL? That is mid to me. And there Cook goes. Another great run from him. And remember what we talked about them. We want to. We want them to to run more outside zone, and especially not from shotgun. That's exactly the kind of run we're talking about. They're really good at it. They just don't do it enough. Also, Cook has been running like a man possessed since his first turnover. Love to see that for him. All right, do they run it again? I would if I was them. I don't care if it's second and long. They are in the danger zone. Oh, my God, they hit it. Okay, <laughs> I'll shut up now. <laughs> they actually hit a pass from the 40. Let's go. <laughs> so don't look now, but if they score here, they can tie it. And somehow, despite turning the ball over and over and over again, it'll be a tie game, which in itself is an accomplishment. All right, trips to the field. Ooh, we motion to a fast four, and it's a keeper. Okay, that's a fun little play call. Using the threat of a fast four to pull everybody, and then you just use Allen as your running back. That's fun. I like that. Keep that one, Dorsey. As a Browns fan, it didn't feel like he had just balled that second half. Oh, didn't feel like he had just balled that second half. I mean, he distributed the ball. He, But, like, they won because of Yak, if we're being honest. And also the defense is amazing. Good 
Good run from Latavius. Do they let Latavius punch it in? He's run really hard all night. I would. They're under center. It's probably going to be a run. There it is. There it is. Good drive from the Bills. Again, when they're balanced, when they're balanced, you pretty much can't stop them. Like, the numbers show that. Like, they are top three in, like, even uh, touchdown drive percentage and, and scoring drive percentage overall when they run the fucking ball. They are extremely hard to stop when they're balanced. So, hopefully they stick with that. Nice little insert from Gabe Davis there, too. Again, another thing that we asked for in the episode was, can we get some more inserts here? Don't forget said Tillman bodying motherfuckers. Uh, yes. So that that throw, Hunter, that I described that Watson missed down the field, or rather didn't pull the trigger on down the field, that was the one where Cedric Tillman... Uh, took an edge rusher's soul, you know, when he came and, and he cracked him from the side in pass pro. It was awesome. It was a great block. I'm sure there's a clip of it on Twitter somewhere. But, yeah, said Tillman blocked his ass off on that play. Anyway, entertaining game now. Happy that we're tied. Happy that we have a decent football game to talk about compared to a lot of the Monday Nighters we've had this year. Best game this week? Uh, best game this week was probably uh, Texans Bengals, I would say, in terms of just like sheer pucker factor. <laughs> At least it was for me. <laughs> the game was miserable to watch but I, I i you know for a third party with no investment in the game probably very entertaining lions chargers was good uh frustrating for me but good uh washington and seattle so i was watching the washington and seattle game up until like live i was watching that one up till about midway through the third quarter and then I turned over to Lions Chargers and then I looked back at the score later and I was like, when the hell did that happen? Like it, the game just exploded late. <laughs> I've been taking a shot for every Bills field goal tonight. Looks like I'm the DD. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been that kind of night for me too. The fact that I'm like the three quote unquote hardest things were a Kincaid TD, Latavia's rushing, and Jaleel McLaughlin receptions. And I got the three hardest ones, but can't get a Von Miller sack and I can't get Tyler Bass field goals. So I'm just staring at staring at my entry longingly, knowing that it's probably not gonna happen. <laughs> Bill's kicking off here. <laughs> Take a shot every time the Bills underachieve. There's not enough alcohol in that entire cabinet back behind me. <laughs> oh, we got a return. <laughs> Did you see the stiff arm? Oh, shit, that's illegal in 12 states, bro. <laughs> God damn. That's assault. Watch this. God, I hope they show that stiff arm. Boom, get off me. <laughs> oh, man. All right, good field position for the Broncos. Feels like they've had good field position all night, honestly. Another good decision from Russ. He's he's honestly played very well tonight in terms of, you know, protecting the ball, 
couldn't do anything about the the, the last one, but uh, protecting the ball, making good decisions, getting down when he needs to get down, taking gains where he can take gains. Like they've they've gotten backed up by penalties a couple times, didn't panic. I think Russ has played as well as you possibly could on the road tonight. Very encouraged by this. Brett, I'm going to sound like EJ, but you were the one po- who posted a video proving the Bills were all or nothing this year, and you bet on their kicker. <laughs> I know. I know. I, 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 I listened to my demons because EJ wasn't here to tell me no. So I caved. I thought, you know, I thought the curse would would deliver me to <laughs> to the promised land. But no, the Bills are the Bills. That's what we've learned tonight. The curse cannot fix them. Oh, look at Russ go. Also, look at that block out in space. Was that Dulcich? Look, that might have been Greg Dulcich. What a block. Oh, no, no, it was Troutman, not Dulcich. Still, though, hell of a block. Look at that stat line from Russell. 15 of 17, 120 yards, touchdown, 32 rushing. You know what that stat line looks like? (laughs) Deshaun Watson. Remember when I said that they're competing for like the 10th best quarterback in the conference? (laughs) Same, 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 same. Ah, and there's the sack. Who was that? I think it was Rousseau. Definitely wasn't Vaughn. Needed that to be Vaughn. Of course, the one time I say that Russ has been getting it out under pressure and then he takes a sack. Who was the gimme tonight, and how would they go below zero yards this week? Tonight it was Josh Allen uh, at at half a passing yard, which, you know, knowing Josh wasn't a guarantee that he was going to get that. <laughs> Another sack here. They're heating him up. Is that Epinesa? It was. How about that? All right. Despite all of their trials and tribulations, the Bills have an opportunity to take a lead here. Somehow. After everything that has gone wrong, they have an opportunity to take a lead. And that's kind of the story of the Bills' year is they dig themselves into holes constantly that they have to dig themselves out of. And they can never just have an easy football game. Like the one easy, quote-unquote, easy game, or really they haven't had an easy game since like week four, right? But in the last month and a half, they they could not have an easy game. Everything had to be difficult. They had to dig themselves into holes. They had to put themselves into positions like this one where it's like late in the third quarter, and they've had turnovers, and they've had stalled drives, and they've turned over on downs, and their defense has kept them in it, and then they have to put together like one late drive to go ahead. Super annoying to watch, not going to lie, because you know that on paper, they should be up by probably double digits by now. Just can't do it. Just can't do it. Always got to shoot themselves in the foot and put themselves into spots like this.
said it earlier, but the Bills' defense is absolutely keeping them alive. The Bills' defense has kept them alive since, honestly, the entire year. Like, the Bills' defense has kept them alive the entire year while they figured their shit out. And Sean McDermott has done a wonderful job with that defense, even with all the injuries, right? Like, they've lost Matt Milano. They lost Trey. Like, I, I can't count how many players they lost in that defense. And they're still playing extremely well and, and giving this team a chance to win. Ken Dorsey is a bit of an issue for this team. When Ken Dorsey runs the ball and and prioritizes balance, I would say he is one of the better play callers in the league in terms of creativity, in terms of scheming up space, in terms of, you know, giving Josh Allen, uh, you know, really easy – you know, there's like a, a, a man beater side and a zone beater side and, and giving Josh Allen answers, right, with, with like full field concepts. It's like, hey, if you get this, if you get middle field closed, go here. If you get middle field open, go here. If you get man here, like Dorsey in terms of pass concepts is extremely good. But sometimes he for, he's like the anti-Greg Roman. Sometimes he forgets that like you still got to run the ball. <laughs> and when he runs the ball and, and still lets those pass concepts shine – He's one of the best in the league. It's just he doesn't do that enough. Could you imagine, like, Dorsey and Greg Roman together on the same staff, though? Like, how hard that would go? Like, fucking LeBron and D-Wade, but for coaching. Oh, great ball from Josh. Huge one. Huge one. So another thing that I pointed out in the video, and so they were at the 15-yard line there. Josh Allen's average depth of target from the 15 and in was like 14.3 yards or something. It was highest in the league by two and a half yards, right? And it's because of stuff like that. They take shots down the field to flip field position, and all of a sudden they're on the other side. Oh, God, they turn it over again. Fuck. No. <laughs> Oh my god. No. 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 Did that just happen in real time? Uh, hold on. I I think we earned him a Lord shot. I don't have a shot glass with me. We're going straight from the bottle. But I I think that earned him a Lord shot. Truthfully. I I did that. That's my fault. I willed that into existence. So bottoms up. Oh, it's the fucking worst. <coughs> I'll tell you what, going from really good bourbon to Malort, not a good decision. <coughs> oh. oh, God, it's just liquid asshole. Oh, I'm actually tearing up. Holy fuck. Oh, God. Oh, that's the worst. I really hope the Bills don't turn it over again, or I'm going to have to do another one of those. <coughs> fuck. Who? Who invented that? And Why? Why? I gotta wash it down. I gotta chase that with bourbon. 
Oh, Jesus. Oh, I'm still tearing up. It's like gasoline mixed with boiled socks. Oh, man. This is what the bills do to me, man. This is what the bills do to me. It's just pain and misery everywhere I turn. All right. Let's see what the Broncos can do to pay this off. It's third and eight already. It's just, it's viscous, you know, it coats the mouth. It's like the worst kind of mouthwash. Oh, God. Um, anyway, so as I was saying, from inside the 15, the Bills take big swings down the field to flip field position. Now, once they get on the other side of the 50, all hell's going to break loose. But that's how they get there. <laughs> this fucking team. Cannot believe them. I mean, I can, but I cannot believe them. Was that on a run too? I miss I missed what the actual fumble was, but it was like a fumbled exchange. Is that what it was? I'm gonna look up the video of it. I didn't even see what it was. Yeah, it was a fumbled exchange. Oh god. <laughs> it just fell out of Josh Allen's hands. Dorsey's never gonna run the ball again. <laughs> He's like, I did it and we fumbled. Never again. You see what happens? Jesus. Uh, the Bills offense is like me playing Madden all passes and six turnovers. <laughs> Everyone we need 15 to, 15, 15 to hold at Scorigami. That means we got to sit through an entire overtime of these two teams pretending to play football. Oh, God. I'd rather shove bamboo shoots through my fingernails. This offense is Chris Farley trying to put on a coat. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, best way to use Malort is as a small amount and a cocktail as a bittering agent. Hold on. That's why I have... Where did I put it? Uh, Shinar? Uh, I also have... Let's see, down there, you can't see it. I got Campari down there, uh, which is at least a tasty bittering agent. Um, I have a whole bunch of... I got the... Fernet Bronca up there that hockey's got me. I got, I got, I got bittering agents. I don't need, I don't need wormwood and death. Anyway, I ran out of space in my, in my cabinets, by the way, for bottles. So I'm trying to drink some of this stuff down so I can actually put it back in the cabinet. Twenty fifteen to eighteen is also a score gami. All right, that's what I'm gonna hope for then. Or whatever will get me to two Tyler Bass field goals. How about that? If that means eighteen to fifteen, I'll take it. <laughs> this has to be one of the weirdest games I've ever watched. Oh, buddy. You haven't seen enough Bills games. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Tuesday for them, buddy. Like this is this is normal. This is standard operating procedure. Kincaid or Laporta? Uh 
I mean, they're they're pretty neck and neck. I don't think you can really go wrong. There we go. Another run. Let's go. You should have seen the Giants game. Oh, believe me, I saw it. Bobby Okereke, like, single-handedly, like, destroyed this Bills offense. That was, like, the Bobby Okereke legacy game. It was, it was that Bills-Giants game. All right, first and 10. Almost at the 25. Nice little slant against off coverage to Diggs. Approaching midfield, the danger zone. We're, we're, they're still in the part where they're good, but we're getting to the part where they're bad. Ooh. Feels like Josh is not wanting to press the ball down the field cuz he's a little bit a little bit worried about what's going to happen if he does. Cat. Oh, did you guys did you guys just hear my cat meowing at me through the door? Is that why you said cat? Cuz you can hear him. Hold on. Here he is. And he only clawed me a little bit when I picked him up. This is fatty. He's he's a very large cat. <laughs> yeah, this is what you wanted. You wanted in here. I think you got well, you got fed. You're fine. I don't know why you're complaining. All right, Josh, unloaded. Incomplete. Another stall. Rough. Rough, rough, rough. Every time I stream in here with the door closed, I feel like uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. In uh, uh, There Will Be Blood. I've abandoned my child. I've abandoned my boy. Gone for three hours and he's yelling at me. I know. he got. I, I fed him like half of his dinner before I even came in here. So it's fine. I'll tell you what, Marvin Mims has some freaking juice. Oh, what a hit. What a hit. Do love the juice of Mims, though. <laughs> he wants more. He wants them. Let's go. He's feisty. Is that Reed Ferguson, the long snapper, right? <laughs> oh, man. You love it. What a hit. We got we got long snappers making tackles out here. <laughs> we got we got wild turnovers. Like this game has everything. I've stopped watching the game and only watching the cat now. Yeah, he's only here because he gets love. That's all. As soon as I stop petting him, he's going to leave. Guarantee it. This is all he wants. He's just... He's a glutton for attention. Unrelated, but out of curiosity, 1 to 10, how concerned are you about Jalen's knee and the Eagles' run game in general? And with Jurgen supposedly coming back, how much of a difference will that make? I mean, Jurgen's coming back does make a big difference, for sure. Um... As for how concerned I am about Jalen's knee, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what the severity of his 
ailment is. I mean, clearly he's got, he's dealing with something. And I'll tell you what, I was really scared uh, when, when it kind of like got bent awkwardly in that last game. Um, I thought that was a bad one, but his, that, that's the thing is like the squats, yeah, the squats are impressive for like lifting weight and everything like that. But really what that does is it strengthens the muscles around the knee so that they're more durable. So that if a guy lands on his leg like that, like there's more protection for the ligaments. It's actually harder for him to tear his knee because he's got quads of steel, right? And everything around the knees, like it's very thick and, and he's got a ton of, ton of body armor there. So um, him never skipping leg day might have saved his knee, unironically, on that play. And I think that it will ultimately help him function with whatever is going on with his knee right now but um as for what as for how concerned i am i'm not entirely sure because i don't know really what it is and we might never know you missed my super chat uh it was about it was, it was that as a seahawks fan i'm a war veteran when it comes to weird heart attack inducing games yeah see ed, especially when it comes to Heart attack inducing games involving Russ. You've done far too many tours, <laughs> far too many tours. Like you, you, you know how this is gonna go. You've seen it many times. Speaking of Russ, now on the field, too high structure presenting quarters here. Probably what they're gonna get. Ooh, roll down the cover three late. Nice tackle from Boyer. Did audio quality go down? I don't think it did. I didn't touch anything. But chat, you can feel free to tell me if something got messed up. Audio is great for me. All right, cool. Another false start. I feel like there have been like three or four of those tonight for Denver. Constantly putting them in bad situations. Not ideal. A little bit sloppy. Uh, what are your thoughts on Rodgers aiming for a mid-December return from his injury, and how do you think it will affect the Jets' season? I'll believe it when I see it. Again, we're talking about a four-month return for an Achilles tear. I will believe that when I see it. Headphones came unplugged, my bad. No problem. Oh, God, that was a backwards pass. Oh, that's a huge fumble. That's going to make it like third and 20. Oh, no. Ugh. That's bad. That's bad. That's really bad. Oh, wait a minute. It got tipped. I didn't see it got tipped. Maybe that was forward. Hold on. Eh, that might have been forward. Okay, they ruled it forward. I think the tip just made it look like it went backwards. Ooh, nice dot to Judy. Working the seam. Good throw. So, look at this. They're presenting one high and then roll down. Oh. Okay, in cover three, the seam's not supposed to be that wide open. Whoever the hook zone player was. Oh, Poyer bit inside. That's what it was. Poyer's supposed to expand out and play the hook, and he bit inside. Ooh. He's going to want that one back tomorrow when he looks at it. Primetime games this year have been just horrid. Yeah, they didn't put the Texans in enough. <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't think they put us in any primetime games. 
like at all. I don't. I don't. I don't think we have a single one. Fatty seems to be comp contemplating a jump down. He's rubbing his face on my keyboard because I'm not rubbing his face for him. He's he's an attention whore. All right, Broncos seem to be doing their best to set up a field goal. Texans flex. Uh, I mean, towards the end of the season, possible they flex the Jags game, maybe, if it's going to determine the division. Actually, no. Jags game isn't week 18. What's their week 18 game? I thought it was. What is their week 18 game? Uh, oh, it's Colts. That's what it was. No, they're not going to flex the Colts in the prime time. Oh, Russ got that out. Let's go. What a play. The little flip to Samaj Pirine for a huge first down. We talk about positive EPA. That play is worth a lot for EPA to turn a potential sack on a third and six in the red zone, keep a drive going. Massive, massive play. All right, fresh set of downs here. FIB, formation into boundary, and they're running into it. They got a few out of it. We'll take that. We'll take that. Fatty's trying to type out his thoughts on CJ Stroud's anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday he was he was very scared of me losing my mind. He he ran and hid from me yesterday. Is his name actually Fatty? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We got them when they were uh tiny little well, little and fatty, since we're little cat and fat cat. Because when we got them, we didn't really know how to name them and one of them was very little and one of them was very fat and me being a college student at the time was not very creative so i called them little cat and fat cat which became fatty and little much to my wife's dismay hmm? yeah <laughs> All right, third and four. If the Broncos can convert this and just keep draining off the clock, try to get seven, they'll have a pretty decent chance. They want the comeback? Yeah, they got the comeback. Oh, I think he was down. He was down. They got to call that down. So we talked a little bit earlier in the game about how any corner that's playing over the top, outside, a lot of offenses have a side adjust to convert to comeback, and that's exactly what they did. You push him five yards past the sticks, he's playing top down on you, you convert it to a comeback. And as long as the ball is out on time before you get back to the, back to the first down marker, it's going to be a first down. You just have to catch it low, and then you get it. So that's exactly what happened there. I'd be willing to bet against a cloud corner. That would have been an automatic convert to a fade. But when you're playing it top down, he's going to convert it to a comeback. Oh, you want out now? Okay. Come on. They both wanted in. Now Little's here. As you can see, he's still very large, but still littler than the other one. <laughs> yeah, so that's the smaller of my cats, and he's still very large. Fatty's 20 pounds, little is like 15. All right. 
a little dirty bunch there to the field. Running weeks. Oh, Javante's got it. Ah, got cut down. Really nice run, though. Didn't even get touched till 10 yards past the line of scrimmage. <laughs> or in, in or out, out or in. <laughs> Cats never know if they want to be in or out. They just, they want the option. That's all. If you take away the option from a cat to be in or out, they will make you pay for that decision. All right. Wing stack. Another run from Javanta. God, he's running hard. Another first down. Look at this clock-killing drive. This has been a fantastic effort from the Broncos. What are they at now on this? How many minutes on this? Let's see. ESPN, Broncos, Bills. So let's see. They got the ball at the... So they're at 625 already. They got the ball with 1222 left in the fourth. It is now about to be five minutes. And the Bills have not had the ball that entire time. Another completion, touchdown. What a drive. Almost seven and a half minutes. How many plays was that? 12 plays. What a drive. That could be a backbreaker, honestly. Great, great drive. Masterfully executed. Push the Bills defensive line around consistently. And looking at the, the run pass distribution, it was run, pass, pass, run, run, pass, run, pass, pass. Run, run, pass. Extremely balanced. Extremely balanced. God, what a drive. What happened to the extra point? What the fuck? I turn away for a second and they fuck up an extra. Ha, ha, ha. I wasn't looking at the game for five seconds and they fuck up an extra point. Are you kidding me? What? Okay. Okay. Fine. Like that's just, that's just, that's the kind of game this is. Fine. I will I will accept the premise that this is an NFL game, but I'm not happy about it. Good God. Just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Like these are these are alleged professional football players. <sighs> like this game is close, <laughs> but I'm not gonna lie to you and say it's been great. <laughs> Wait, that might ruin potential Scorigami. Uh, oh, would, would Scorigami have been 22-15? That would ruin Scorigami, huh? Lagavul in 16 year for me. One of my favorite scotches. I think... Uh, this is not having to do with scotch. Um, my friends are going to... Ireland and Scotland in April um, and they, they're going in mid-April and they asked me to come along it's for 30th birthday and the draft is the last week of April so I can't go their second leg which is in Scotland because I have to go to Detroit but the week before that they're gonna be in Ireland so I think I'm gonna go to Ireland that week in mid-April and uh go to some Irish whiskey distilleries 
you know, stop by, stop by Jameson, stop by, uh, well, I don't know what part of Ireland we're going to be in, but either way, find, find me an Irish distillery, get me some bottles and souvenirs to take home. So if any of you guys are in Ireland and you're around in mid April, let me know. And then I come back, and like a day after I come back, I think is when I'm going to go to Detroit. So it, April will be a very uh, uh, eventful month for me. Brett, are you doing a Bryce vid this year? Uh, I think I might do like just a year-long retrospective after. Because I don't just want it to be like another like, oh, the offensive line sucks. Like, I want it to, like, really be a, a deep dive of, like, here's why the offensive line sucks, but I feel like it's going to take a lot of time. Like, this Bills episode, the, the Bills one that I released this week, took a lot of man hours, like a lot of hours. And I want to do the same thing for the Panthers, but I think it's going to take even longer. And so that might just be an off-season thing. Oh, there goes Cook. Oh, God, another fumble. Oh, we got it back. What the fuck? No way. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what is this game? Dude. This game is so drunk. And honestly, it's been drunk from the very start. <laughs> High and tight, dude. High and tight. Come on now. Oh my god. Now, if he if he lost it, that would have been a malort. That would have been a malort shot if he lost it. He spared me, thankfully. But also, I want to know who rubbed Vaseline all over the ball before this game because between the Bills receivers not being able to catch and them constantly fumbling, like, like, at some point, I'm like, okay, I, I go to the equipment staff and I say, how were these balls prepped? Were they prepped any differently than normal? Because nobody on the Bills can hang on to their own balls. I'm sure there's a Manscaped, Manscaped ad read in there somewhere <laughs> that I could find. <laughs> Another cook run. Oh, easy peasy off the edge. See, when he hangs on to it, he's super explosive. Nice little fold block out there. Exactly what we were talking about. Introduce more fold blocks. Give yourself some angles to work with. This is a good drive. Oh, he almost broke that too. Almost. Uh, Christmas, Ron Zacapa, 23 uh, XO, perfect tones for season. Yeah, you, you've so you've been speaking very highly of the Zacapa 23 for a long time. It's still on my list to get it. But I, I have not forgotten. I have not forgotten. I know how much you love that one. How does this game affect LeBron's legacy? <laughs> oh, man. How much clock is left? So it's two minutes to go. If I'm the Bills, God, because you want to score, but you don't want to score with too much time, right? Because if they, if they get six, like no matter what, a field goal would win it. So the idea is to score at the last, as late as you possibly can to leave them no time to go get a field goal. But that's easier said than done, you know. Because if you get an opportunity to score, like if they give you an opportunity to score on the first play, which who knows, Sean Payton might do that. 
he might just say let him in so that we get two minutes to go down and get a field goal. Because if we're just playing the clock, like Denver only has two timeouts, Buffalo has three. Now, let's see. What's the what's the, what's the down right now? I think it's second down, right? So, it's second and goal. Coming out of the two-minute warning. How about this? If you, get, if you get a stop on second down, you call timeout. Because if you then get a stop on third down, you burn your, your extra timeout. And then it's fourth down. And if they get it on fourth down, you're still going to have like a minute 40 with no timeouts to go get a field goal. So how about that? You don't let them score. But if you get a stop, you call your first timeout. If you don't get a stop, then you let them score and you preserve the timeouts so that you can get it with like, I don't know, minute 20, minute 30, and two timeouts. So everything kind of relies on this second down. The over-under was set at 46 and a half. What is it at now? See, it's 20. Oh, God. Yeah, they're not even close. I'm up by 6.12. I can take a one-yard rushing TD from Cook and nothing else. <laughs> oh, God. Maximum pucker factor. If they don't score the season, I assume you're talking about the Bills. If they don't score, the season is over. Well, if they don't score, they'll be 5-5 five and five in a very loaded AFC after losing a tiebreaker to Cincy. Like, it'll be tough. All right, Josh is in. So your fantasy game is saved. Josh is in. They score here. So Broncos are going to get it with, what, 155 and two timeouts? Now now on the onus is on the Broncos, right? Because the Bills have all three timeouts still. So the Broncos need to work down the field quickly, but not too quickly. Because if they go down and get a field goal too fast, and you're leaving Josh Allen like 45 seconds or even 35 seconds and three timeouts... That's still not a guarantee, right? So there's still a lot of a lot of gamesmanship to be had here. Or not gamesmanship. What's what's uh what's the term for that? Not freakonomics. I don't know. There's a specific term for that that I can't remember right now. <laughs> I had far too much bourbon. Strategy, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> game theory, there we go. Game theory. That's what I was looking for, chat. Thank you. Losing the turnover battle by minus three and having a chance to win the game is crazy. That's the Bills, baby. That's what they do. I still can't believe they missed that extra point. That's brutal. Completely changes this game. At least overtime was an option before. All right, let's see what Denver's got here. They missed two extra points. Yeah, fair point.
Oh, there we go. <laughs> I tweeted as a joke a couple of minutes ago. They left too much time for Smash AP Ryan, and then he immediately gets a big gain. <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't mean for that to happen. <laughs> Oh my god. This fucking game. Who's down? Looks like a bill. Chad, are you able to see who's down? They really can't afford any more injuries on defense. They've already had so many. That's rough. Cam, Cam again? Oh, man. Second one tonight. I'm trying to see. Uh, I think he got a stinger from how he went in. His helmet was down. So he's kind of grabbing his arm. I think it might have been a stinger. Yeah. That sucks. Those hurt. So I think that would mean DeMar Hamlin's in, right? Yeah, he is. Number three. I see him out there. If Tamar Hamlin ends this game with a pick, you know that the NFL is completely scripted. What do you got? Oh, he takes off. So it's second and 10. Still manageable out of midfield. Still got two timeouts. Obviously four down. Hamlin on Troutman in the slot. Another catch from Piran. First down, got to move, got to move. You still got time, though. You got two timeouts. You still got time. You got to be urgent. Still tackled and bound. You still got two timeouts. You're still okay. Slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. Oh, they took a timeout. Never mind. I didn't think they would take it that quickly, but I guess so. Sean ain't using timeouts. No, he wanted to bleed off clock because he because the Bills have two timeouts themselves. Uh, he didn't want to leave Allen with like a minute and two timeouts, right, to potentially respond with a field goal of their own. So he you gotta you gotta get down there, but you still gotta leave time. Or you still got to bleed time so that Josh Allen can't respond. So you still got a timeout. You got 40 seconds. It's, what is it, second down, I think, right? Second and four. This is going to be a run. Got to be a run. Because now you're trying to force Buffalo to use their timeouts. Best case scenario, you get a run for four yards. You get a first down. They, they use a timeout. You still have your timeout. I'd be stunned if this is a pass. Yeah, see, they're bringing zero. They're gonna play. They're gonna play run on the way to the quarterback. They're saying, "Go ahead, fucking run it into this." 
Oh, God, you can't take a sack. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Do you not have a zero check? Like, what are we doing? Do you not have a check for... They, they were literally showing it to you for 10 seconds. What is your zero check? Oh, my God. What... What are we doing? What are we doing? All right, third and 10 on the Buffalo 45... Now you have to pass it because you're looking at, was it, 55, 63 yard field? Like, you have to throw. You have to throw. And then you got to be ready for another, you know, fire drill to get your kicker out there because you already used a timeout. Good Lord. What a disaster. And they brought zero again. Oh, God. Oh, no, they got bailed out by P.I. Oh, my God. Underthrown go ball. Best play in football, boys. Oh, my God. So their zero check was to hit it deep because you know the DB is going to be playing it flat-footed and coming downhill, and then he underthrew it so that Judy would adjust back into him. And Teron took the bait. Unbelievable. Why does Brett want the Broncos to win? Honestly, I don't care who wins this game. I just want good football. And I get mad when teams do bad football things. Not having a zero check against zero is kind of annoying to me. But that was their zero check. I'll, I'll diagram it for you guys because I'm assuming they're going to get a field goal here. All right, this is not like numerically accurate, but it's going to convey the concept, right? So, zero, right? Let's say. So they're bringing eight. We got seven in protection. They got they got one more than we can protect. We know that they're gonna they're gonna beat us in protection. The Broncos zero check, which I think they also might have been trying to hit the first time because I thought I saw Troutman going vertical down the field in the one angle they gave it to us. And I think the pocket might have collapsed before Russ could hit it. But it, So that's possible. They, they might have actually had a zero check. They just fucking failed at it. But anyway, the zero check they had on uh, was it third, third and 10. So you got Judy. Let's just say that this is uh, Teron Johnson. Judy. Inside release go. We know that that we're not going to be able to hold hold up in protection, but we also know that Teron Johnson has literally no help behind him, and Teron's going to be playing this flat footed so that he can drive on anything underneath. Because a lot of zero checks, like oh, we're hitting a slant, we're hitting a quick out, something like that. Teron's going to be playing it flat footed because the idea is that you're not going to be able to throw it deep anyway because the pressure is going to get there too quick. So you saw Russ throw it off his back foot, fading away from pressure, trying to get it out in front here. And we've seen some teams attack zero that way, including the Bills. They did it against Miami a couple of years, or last year. Um, we saw Tua do it against Detroit last year before they turned their shit around. Like attacking vertically against zero by just acknowledging that it's a one on one and the DB is going to be playing it flat footed is a viable answer. You got to hit the throw, though. In Denver's case, because Russ threw it off his back foot, he left it here. Judy had to come back and adjust through Teron Johnson. Hence, P.I. Now, is that kind of a 
shitty way to end a football game. Yes. Is it the rule? Yes. I think you could argue that it's... What? Oh, okay, they're doing... <laughs> I was like, what's what's going on here? Why are their bodies moving? They were just doing their whole run people out drill thing. Oh, God, he missed it. Flag? Dude... Football is stupid. Why do I do this to myself? Oh, my God. There's not enough bourbon in the world for this game. I'm going to pour myself more. Fucking Bills, man. All right, hit it, game over, and we are all officially worst people for witnessing that. Do you feel fulfilled? (laughs) I don't know if I do. (laughs) Oh, God. What a shitty game. (laughs) I can't imagine how Bills fans feel right now. Like, I cannot imagine taking the day off work and, like, spending all your money, harder money, to go to that game and watch that in person. I cannot imagine how I would feel as a Bills fan. My God. Anyway, checking on the slip. We hit three out of five. Did not get our $680. Because I bet on a kicker. Because I'm an idiot. But we have an opportunity to redeem ourselves. Because on Thursday, again, over on our podcast channel, the Bootleg Football Podcast, we do Thursday night streams every single Thursday. It's Bengals Ravens this week. We'll have the whiteboard out again. We'll be breaking stuff down. EJ will be with me. I will hopefully not have to drink any more Malort in that game. Uh, Knowing my luck, though, we'll see. Uh, Again, that's over on the Bootleg Football Podcast channel. And we have our Week 10 recap episode coming out tomorrow morning. And then, God, what else we got? And then we got a a Week 11 preview coming out on Friday. So, uh, if... If this was entertaining to you, thank you. I, I try. I really do. I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I try. I hope you guys had fun tonight. Um, I really enjoy how active you guys were in chat. We had great questions. Um, you know, I, the Grassi and Perna raid was awesome. Uh, I appreciate all of you very, very much. And uh, remember, if you're a patron, we have our patron-only Q&A on the Discord tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. I don't think I have anything else to plug. With that, uh, hope you guys get a good night's sleep and mentally recover from whatever the fuck that was. Anyway, I'll see you guys very soon. Thank you.